Good afternoon from Council Chamber. We are live. Hello, everyone. Today, I would like to call to order the um, City Council public hearing. We will start with uh, land acknowledgement. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of the Treaty 6 territory and acknowledge the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marched this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Soto, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, and now settlers from around the world. And we will do a roll call now. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette. I'm sure he will join us shortly. Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Thank you. Mayor Sohi will be joining us shortly. Councillor Hamilton. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Rutherford. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Salvador. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Cartmel. I'm sure he will be joining us shortly. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And could I ask uh, Councillor Hamilton to move adoption of the agenda? I will move the adoption of the May 10th public hearing agenda uh, as, as I think it was presented. Second. Thank you. Please vote. I'm a yes. Yes, ma'am. I'm a yes. I'm a yes as well. I'm a yes. Yes. Doug Rutherford is a yes and Cartmel is absent. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. And I do not see any, any protocol items here, no. So now we will call for persons to speak. And shall I start with the introductory remarks? Yes, please, Madam Chair. All right, so the clerk will call out the bylaws to be dealt with. I will call out the names of the people registered to speak to each bylaw. Next, council members will select the bylaws that they wish to discuss and vote on any bylaws that have not been selected for discussion. Council will then deal with each of the bylaws that were selected for discussion and debate. For each item, administration will first provide an overview of the bylaw. Members of the public who have registered to speak will then be invited to make their presentations. Those in favor will speak first in panels, followed by those in opposed in panels. Each person will have five minutes to make comments. The clerk will run the official timer in council chamber. The timer lights on the podiums will be green for the first four minutes, turn yellow when there is one minute remaining, and flash red when the five minutes are up. If you are participating virtually, you may wish to use a timer of your own. When everyone in your panel has had a chance to present, members of council may ask questions of you or other panel members. For this reason, we, you may wish to remain in the meeting until all questions have been asked of your panel. After comments from the public, council may ask questions of city administration. 
After all questions of administration have concluded, I will ask Council if they wish to discuss any further questions of those who presented in response to new information that may have arisen during the public hearing. Thereafter, Council may close the public hearing and debate the bylaw. If you are participating virtually, please remember to mute your microphone when you are not speaking. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please reach out to the Office of the City Clerk using the contact information provided in your confirmation of registration or at city.clerk at edmonton.ca. If you are here with us in person, welcome. The clerk will guide you to your seat when it's your turn to speak. As Edmonton transitions from provincial mask mandates, the city temporary mask bylaw, we ask visitors to council chamber to be kind and respectful to each other. You can wear a mask to protect yourself and those around you, and please respect people's personal decisions around wearing masks. In the event of an emergency, please follow the clerk's directions to evacuate. City staff will direct you to your muster point. Madam Clerk, may you please call the bylaws. Thank you, Madam Chair. Items 3.1, Bylaw 19951, closure of a portion of 143rd Street Northwest, 142nd Street Northwest, and 126th Avenue Northwest, road right of way located north of Yellowhead Trail, Brown Industrial. Item 3.2, Bylaw 19952, amendments to the Yellowhead Corridor Area Structure Plan. And item 3.3, .3, Charter Bylaw 19953 to allow for medium industrial uses, Brown Industrial will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to items 3.1, 3.2, 3.3? Yes, we have Chris Lima and Chris Thiessen, both in favor and no one opposed. Can we confirm, please, that both Chris Lima and Chris Thiessen are online? Good afternoon. I'm here. It's Chris Lima. Thank you. Uh, Chris Thiessen is also present, and both Chris and I are here for questions only. Thank you very much. Item 3.4, Charter Bylaw 20065 to rezone land for low and medium density residential de development, the orchards, orchards at Ellerslie. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.4? Yes, in favor, we have Elise Shillington from Stantec and Peter Tustakalas from Brookfield Properties. Um, are you both remote? Are you with us? Yes, good afternoon, this is Elise. Uh, good afternoon, Peter. Good afternoon. Thank you. Item 3.5, Charter Bylaw 20085 to rezone land for residential use in the Secor neighborhood. Is there anyone to speak for item 3.5? Yes, in favor, we have Sarah Sherman to answer questions only and PJ Pescott to answer questions as well, uh, both remotely. Are you both with us? Yeah, good afternoon, I'm here. Yes, I'm here as well. Great, thank you. Item 3.6, Charter Bylaw 20086 to rezone land for residential use in the Secor neighborhood. Is there anyone here to speak to item 3.6? Yes, in favor, again, we have Sarah Sherman and PJ Pescod, and we know they're with us, thank you. Item 3.7, Charter Bylaw 20053 to create a special area river view and the RVRH river view, river view row housing zone at the uplands and river's edge. Item and item 3.8, Charter Bylaw 20054 to allow for low density residential and multi unit housing in the form of row housing. The upl uplands will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to items 3.7 and 3.8? Yes, we have Yolanda Liu. We also have Keith Davies to answer questions only, Nicholas Carrolls to answer questions only, and Rihanna Raymond to answer questions only. 
Can you please confirm you are all with us? Good afternoon. This is Yolanda Liu. Um, I am available for questions only unless council would like a presentation. Thank you. And Keith Davies here as well. Hello. Good afternoon. Nicholas Carl's here. Good afternoon. Rihanna Raymond here. Great. Good afternoon. Item 3.9, Charter Bylaw 20060 to allow for the development of multi-unit housing in the form of row housing with taller heights and increased site coverage, Rosenthal. Do we have anyone to speak to item 3.9? Yes, in favor, we have Elise Shillington and she confirmed that she is with us. Item 3.10, Charter Bylaw 20089 to allow for the expansion of the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology's main campus, Blatchford. Do we have anyone to speak to item 3.10? Yes, in favor, we have Kyle Witu and Jacqueline McLeod, Greg Topinka, and Yolanda Liu. And I know Yolanda, you confirmed you are with us. Are the rest of the speakers with us? Yes, uh, Kyle Witu here. Um, I'm available for questions only unless council would like a presentation. And Jack Jacqueline McLeod, I'm here as well. Uh, Greg Schmenker here as well. Great, thank you. Item 3.11, Charter Bylaw 20077 to allow for an increased range of industrial business uses and limited compatible commercial uses, CPR Irvine. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.11? Yes, in favor, we have Corey Latourney. Corey, I can see you online, you're with us. Can you say hi? We'll just check your speaker. Yes, I'm here, sorry. There you go, great, thank you. Item 3.12, bylaw 20082 to amend the Jasper Place area redevelopment plan and item 3.13, Charter Bylaw 20083 to allow for medium rise multi unit housing West Jasper Place will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.12 and 3.13? We have no speakers listed for this item. Items. Item 3.14. Charter Bylaw 20009 to allow for small scale infill development. Sherwood, do we have anyone to speak to item 3.14? Yes, in favor, we have Tara Slater and Jenica Collette. Can you please both confirm you are with us? Good afternoon, I'm Jenica Collette. I'm present and available to speak to any questions. And this is Terry Slater, also present and available for questions. Great, thank you. Item 3.15, Charter Bylaw 20087, to allow for the development of ground oriented multi unit housing Woodcroft. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.15? Yes, in favor, we have Song Lin Pan to answer questions only. And opposed, we have Jill Sarulis. In. Hello, and Nella Callahu. Good afternoon, Nella Callahu here. Good afternoon, thank you. And Song Lin. Can we, can we just get confirmation if Song Lin Pan is online? We don't see them, so we can continue. So we can end the show here in person. Yeah. Item 3.16, Charter Bylaw 20078, to allow for cannabis retail sales in an existing commercial development, Glenwood. 
Is there anyone here to speak to item 3.16? Yes, in favor, we have Jeet Nair to answer questions only. Jeet, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hello, thank you. Item 3.17, bylaw 20079 to amend the 109th Street Corridor Area Redevelopment Plan. Item 3.18, Bylaw 20080 to amend the McKernan Belgravia Station Area Redevelopment Plan and Item 3.19 Charter Bylaw 20081 to allow for low rise multi unit housing and small scale infill development McKernan are being dealt with together. Do we have anyone to speak to items 3.17, 3.18, and 3.19? Madam Chair, we did have a late addition, or a last minute addition, I should say, um, to that, and we have uh, Ray Watkins uh, in favor. Ray, are you online? In person? I'm sorry, I'm just, not, I'm just here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay. Item 3.20, bylaw 20058. Amendment to the Clarvarton Neighborhood Structure Plan and Item 3.21, Charter Bylaw 20059, to allow for low density residential uses, medium density residential uses, a stormwater management facility, and park uses. Clarvarton will be dealt with together. Do we have anyone here to speak to Item 3.20 and 3.21? Yes, in favor, we have Amy Stewart to answer questions only. And opposed, we have Ivan Babic and Farley Uras. Good. Good afternoon, it's Ivan Babic here, I'm present. Thank you. Item 3.22, Charter Bylaw 20075, to allow for low-rise multi-unit housing development, Eastwood. Do we have anyone to speak to item 3.22? We have no speakers listed. <laughs> item 3.23, Bylaw 20021, to amend the Central McDougal Queen Mary Park Area Redevelopment Plan and Item 3.24 Charter Bylaw 20022 to allow for low rise multi unit housing development. Central McDougal will be dealt with together. Do we have anyone to speak to items 3.23 and 3.24? Yes, in favor, we have Marcelo Figuera, Dinesh Deshpande, Gurmeet Sandhu. Opposed, we have Randy Mayhort, Warren Champion, Michael Brown, and Paul Grable. Can you please uh, confirm you are with us? Um, good afternoon, it's Marcelo here. Um, we do have a presentation if selected. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, this is Nyanesh Deshpande from Green Space Alliance. Good afternoon, and this is Paul Grable. I'll be presenting uh, on the opposition side. My name is Randy Mehort, and I'll also be presenting an opposing view. So, Madam Chair, I believe we're still looking for confirmation for Gurmeet Santu, Warren Champion, and Michael Brown. We also have another person who has registered for item 3.23 and 3.24, speaking in opposition, Ron Sadaway. Gurmeet Sandhu, Warren Champion, Michael Brown, and Ron Sadaway. 
Do we have anyone? Hi. Is that Ron? Hi, Ron. And anyone online that we mentioned? Maybe they're not with us. And item 3.25, Charter Bylaw 20074, to allow for industrial and compatible non-industrial businesses, excluding crematoriums, Prince Rupert. Do we have anyone to speak to item 3.25? Yes, in favor, we have Dave Onoshenko, Dennis Rego, Ranan Solons. In opposition, there's Jan Naparella, Pat Matthews, Doris Shannon, Mona Ng, Tom Boots, T2 Trong Pham, on behalf of Tian Hai Nguyen, Kerry Anton, and Marilyn Dumke. Can you all confirm that you are with us? Hi, Pat Matthews here. I think Marilyn left the meeting. She no, I'm was back. So oh, you hey, are. How are you? This is Dave Onishenko. Uh, I'm present. This is Raynan Sounds. I'm present. This is uh, Dennis Regal. I'm present. Jan Naparella, I'm present. Doris Shannon, I'm present. This is Mona Ng, present. And do we have Don T. Tutrong Pham or Carrie Anton with us? Yeah, Chang Pham here. Yeah. Carrie Anton here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And that's the speaker's list. No uh, last additions to the speaker's list? I believe we have caught everyone. Okay, great, thank you. And now we will, um, I'll ask my colleagues to uh, sign up to um, pick bylaws to be debated. Councillor Rutherford? Yes, thank you. I would like to select item 3.15. And that would be it for you. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson? Yes, thank you. I'd like to select um, 3738. Uh, and we have speakers on uh, 323, 324, and 325, so I'll select those as well. Thank you. Councillor Rice? <clears throat> Thank you. I would like to select 3.16. Thank you, Councillor Rice. <laughs> Councillor Knack. Thank you. Uh, just a, a quick question on 312, 313, please. Okay, thank you. And I will be selecting 3.20 and 3.21. Are there any other selections requested? Councillor Principe, I will move closure of the public hearing on items 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, 3.4, 3.5, 3.6, 3.9, 3.10, 3.11, 
Second. Thank you. Any questions? Please vote. In favor. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. Madam Chair, I'll move first reading of items 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, 3.4, 3.5, 3.6, 3.9, 3.10, 3.11, 3.14, 3.17, 3.18, 3.19, 3.22. Second. Thank you. That was um, Councillor Rutherford. Okay, thank you. And uh, any questions? Please vote. In favor. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. Madam Chair, I'll move second reading of the items 3.1, 3.2, 3.3. 3.4, 3 3.5, 3.6, 3.9, 3.10, 3.11, 3.14, 3.17, 3.18, 3.19, and 3.22. Second. Thank you, and please vote. In favor. We have all the votes. Please dis display the votes. And that is carried. Madam Chair, I'll move consideration of third reading of items 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, 3.4, 3.5, 3.6, 3.9, 3.10, 3.11, 3.14, 3.17, 3.18, 3.19, and 3.22. Second. Thank you. Please vote. In favor. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. Madam Chair, I will move third and final reading of Bylaw 19951, Bylaw 19952, Bylaw 19953, Charter Bylaw, pardon me, Charter Bylaw 19953, Charter Bylaw 20065, Charter Bylaw 20085, Charter Bylaw 20086, Charter Bylaw 20060, Charter Bylaw 20089, Charter Bylaw 20077, Charter Bylaw 20009, Bylaw 20079, Bylaw 20080, Charter Bylaw 20081, and Charter Bylaw 20075. Second. Thank you. That was well done. Please vote. In favor. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the votes. And that is carried. Uh, Councillor Stevenson, you chose uh, 3.7 and 3.8. Would you like to have a presentation? Uh, Does administration have a presentation? Yeah. We do. Yeah, no, no need for a presentation on my behalf. I don't know if anyone else wants one. No? Okay, great. Um, I can just start with some... Oh, do we yeah, no, go right... Um, yeah, I know that uh, Yolanda Liu did have a presentation if requested, or she was just for questions only, if... Yeah, thank you. I, I have some questions for the applicant, um, but I don't think I need the presentation, if that's all right. 
Yeah, okay, thank Please you. I'll, I'll go into questions. Um, thank you so much. I just, I wanted to start by saying I'm so pleased to see this special area zoning come forward. I think it's a really great approach and, and absolutely the right tool to be using. Um, so, so really pleased to see that work happening. I guess I just had some questions around uh, the built form. So I appreciated seeing some of the precedents. Um, I had a chance to visit some of those in many, many years ago, sort of see a similar uh, row house development. And I have some lingering questions or concerns just around um, the front and rear setbacks in terms of the conditions they create. Um, and I just want to speak to the applicant just in terms of that 5.5 meter rear setback. What, what is driving that? Um, just recognizing that with, with the attached garage that you do end up with a really significant uh, driveway and hard surfaced area. Um, there's no real amenity space being provided there. So again, just wondering if that's being driven by a uh, customer desire for a large driveway or if there are other factors that are influencing that. Uh, okay, thank you, Councillor Stevenson. The 5.5 meter setback for the rear attached garage is actually a requirement of city transportation. And so it's to allow for a vehicle to park in the back without encroaching into the lane. And yet in, in many of our other zones, we have as little of a, as a 1.2 meter setback. Um, what, what's the, the logic there? And I can ask uh, the administration yeah. too. Yeah, <laughs> you could ask them as well, but typically with the detached garages, they've got the 1.2 meter setback and with an attached garage, the city requires the 5.5 meters. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll follow that up with administration. And then just in terms of the front setback as well, I noted it was a 4.5 meter instead of, you know, a more, a more urban or street oriented uh, three meters. Again, just wondering what was, what was the driving force there? Uh, yeah, the 4.5 meters is consistent with the other uh, zones where it is a 4.5 meter setback for RF5, for example. Uh, typically, it's reduced to three should a treed boulevard be provided, but the 4.5 does allow for uh, additional trees on the property themselves and not just on the boulevard. Okay, and um, my memory of the, the provisions of this DC was that there, there wasn't that option to go down to three meters if there is a treed boulevard? Correct, yeah, because they are losing their backyard as well with the attached garage, we felt the larger 4.5 would accommodate a little additional open space for them. Okay, great, well, thanks for that clarity. I'll follow up with a few uh, questions of administration. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And is there anyone else to ask questions of the speakers? All right, Councillor Stevenson, would you like to ask questions of administration? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so that was, that was um, I'm very curious to learn about that 5.5 meter setback requirement in the rear. Uh, again, I, I feel that, that that leads to quite a bit of um, unused uh, space uh, with a lot of hard surfacing. So just wondering what the rationale was there and um, yeah, what, what options might be available moving forward? Uh, yes, um, uh, in terms of 5.5 meters, we um, established it through uh, not only looking at the current practices, but also through a jurisdictional scan that we did uh, when uh, for other areas as we were looking at some DCs and special uh, zones. And uh, generally speaking, 5.5 uh, is the number that has uh, been successfully used uh, without uh, encroaching on the pedestrian realm and uh, not, um, and, and also um, I think uh, length of the vehicle could be even more uh, in some cases, but this is a reasonable um, setback that uh, we, we came up. And I guess I'm just struggling again, compared to other other garages where we do allow that 1.2. So I'm just, I'm unclear about that, that con the physical constraint, why, why we are requiring that a vehicle can be parked on the driveway instead of just in the garage, like we do with other, other detached garages. So 1.2 meter, uh, I believe that's more to just accommodate the sight lines uh, as the car is moving out of the garage. And uh, the intent is not uh, to park the car uh, outside. Uh, whereas here uh, there is that uh, ability and it also frees up some uh, some of the pressures on on street parking. Uh, that's another uh, consideration, I would say. Well, I mean, I, you know, I, 
as we all know, we've moved away from that minimum parking requirement and, and sort of moving to more of a market demand. So again, I wasn't I wasn't hearing from the applicant that that the parking spaces on the driveway were that it was being driven by a market demand. Um, so again, just wondering the city's interest in, in having that space. Yeah, like, like I said, we, we can look into if uh, that's, that's the council's uh, wish uh, to, to go back and look into it one more time and see. Sure, and I, I appreciate, you know, not wanting to, to slow this application down. And so, um, you know, recognizing because it is a, a, a special area, you know, that, that zone can be amended in the future. But I would look to, to direction. I can maybe follow up in further information with the applicant about the, the right way forward. But I think if, if, if there's a, a desire from the applicant to, to not have that driveway, I think that allows better, better use of the land. I mean, I think the other consideration too is just the setback uh, of the buildings across the lanes. I recognize that we don't, 1.2 might not be sufficient just to provide that, that space between the buildings. Um, but I think, I think there's a real opportunity there if, if there's no natural constraint and it's just sort of a, a policy standard that we have, I think it could be worth revisiting that. But again, don't wanna hold this application up um, un unduly. Councillor Stevenson, um, that's good feedback and something we can consider as this zone is used again in the future, um, that perhaps we can leverage the opportunity to uh, further tweak this in the, in the next rezoning for this type of zone. Perfect, that sounds like a really great approach uh, in my mind. I'm happy to circle back with the applicant just to confirm that that's, that's a good strategy for them. But that's a great, great idea, thank you. No further questions. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Um, can I ask you to close the bylaw or one of my other colleagues? Or not? Madam right, Chair, are there any questions uh, of the applicant with uh, the further information we have received? Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, thank you to my colleagues for your patience. Uh, um, Ms. Liu, just, just circling back to you, does that sound like a good approach that we can move forward with the application as is and that uh, for future rezonings using this special area zone that, that you, if you wish, may, may consider a, uh, a shorter setback? Uh, yes, definitely something that we can consider in the future. Perfect, okay, thank you so much. I, I'm happy to move closure of the public hearing. Second. Second. Uh, thank you, Councillor Stevenson and Councillor Knack. Sorry, Councillor Wright, I think Councillor Knack was just a little bit sooner. And I'll ask my colleagues to vote on the closure of the bylaw, please. In favor. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. I'll, I'll move second, first reading of um, uh, Charter Bylaw, or uh, items three, seven, and three, eight. Second. Thank you, please vote. In favor. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. Thank you, I'll move second reading of items three, seven, and three, eight. Second. Thank you, please vote. In favor. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. I'll move consideration of third reading for items three, seven, and three, eight. Second. Please vote. In favor. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. And I'll move uh, third and final reading of Charter Bylaw 20053 and Charter Bylaw 20054. Second. Thank you, please vote. In favor. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried.
So now we'll be moving on to bylaw 3.12, 3.13 to be dealt together. And Madam Chair, I don't uh, need a presentation. Happy to go straight to questions if, uh, if no one else on council needs it. Okay, great. We'll go straight to questions. I see we have no speakers, so you can ask questions of administration. Mama. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. And sorry, I feel like I feel like I actually should let Councillor Stevenson go first uh, uh, because you are the one that rightfully uh, flagged this early. Um, but but actually, just wanted to check um, on the need for the ARP amendment in the first place because. If I remember correctly, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I think one of my colleagues might remember even better correctly, uh, I thought it was set up so we didn't need to do an amendment on situations like this. So I wanted to understand that, if you don't mind clarifying. I didn't think we would need it for this scenario. Thank you for the question. Um, we, we knew we had one of the authors on board, so <laughs> it's certainly something that we thought about. Um, based on the, the intensity difference with the extra height, um, we did deem upon rereading it that it was appropriate to go in for the ARP amendment. Um, however, with direction from council, I'm sure we could um, consider how we approach these in the future. Yeah, I guess I guess that would be the piece is that we don't want to have, you know, I think, I, because I, I, it's so weird, I'm talking through the person who, I remember when we were at the public hearing uh, for the original approval of the plan, and I happened to ask at the time, somebody was sitting in that chair and now sitting two chairs beside me, about if we had this set up so that if you could do larger heights, if we would need to do that, because I think we, we, we also don't want to, I think there, there's sometimes a concern when you're amending the ARP and there's a lot of communities that sort of see that as a, oh, it's a big change because you're amending the ARP versus something that I, I don't think is actually a significant move. So, so what I'm hearing is that maybe there might be an option in future applications to look at that. I, I think I probably have to ask Mr. Johnson this is that making sure we're, because I think sometimes we're a little extra cautious on, on the amendment of the ARP and I'm not sure we needed to be here. And so that's something we can check out going forward. Yes, Councillor. Clearly, your feedback can be taken into account on the next application that comes. I wouldn't change this one here today. I without understand. Causing grief. Okay. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. That's 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 the case. But the same thing. You can take that back and look at that. For we anything. can certainly look at it again. However, upon reading the the ARP, I mean, it is set for low rise apartment, and so you're looking at an eight story building. Uh, Mm -hmm. or six-story building, six story. sorry, with uh, RA, RA8. Yeah. Um, and so there, there is still some uncertainty left in terms of how we're, we're currently dealing with low-rise apartments, and typically four stories is what we would consider a low-rise apartment. So potentially as part of the zoning bylaw renewal, depending on the outcomes there, that also might change that. Or direction future, from district so. plan. Yeah, then district plan. Okay, great. Those are all uh, my questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Knack. Councillor Stevenson? Yes, and I, I apologize for the awkwardness of the situation, but my, my, my recollection um, was that the ARP was being finalized at a time when building code changes were uh, going from wood frame at four story to wood frame at six story. And so my recollection is that the intent was that low rise would be sort of that wood frame, whatever, whatever that could be defined as. So up, up to six stories potentially at the time. Um, so, you know, further to Councillor Knack's comments, I think I, I agree that I think think that the amendment in the in future consideration, I think that that six story baseline, because I think that that's kind of the new the the new baseline of low low rise um, could could be interpreted that way. Or that was certainly the intent of how the plan was originally written. Um, but maybe just a further clarification as well, just in terms of. Whether, whether administration is planning to provide um, some guidance. I was, I was going back through city plan as well just to see what the thresholds there are for low and mid and high. Um, any, any considerations there around some further, further clarifications? So through both zoning bylaw and district planning, uh, that question is being looked at to further refine what's in city plan, uh, which sort of outlines those designations of low, mid and high. Uh, and they should follow a, a standard course between those two new policy documents. Great, and, and it, it does get really tricky because I think that there is, there's sort of low rise, like low rise and then also like low rise multifamily as well and those being somewhat distinct. But in any case, um, those were all my questions slash comments and uh, appreciate, appreciate the project going forward. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. 
Do we have any more questions of administration? Seeing none, and I don't think we have any speakers on this, so I, uh, Madam Chair, I can move closure of the public hearing for items 3.12 and 3.13. Thank you, and a seconder? Second. Second. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Please vote. Madam Chair, we can ask for clarifying questions. Oh, sorry, rather, questions on the first reading, apologies. Sorry about that. Do we have any questions on the first reading? I, th I think this was closure on the closure of the bylaw. I don't see any, so we'll call the vote. Thank you. In favor. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the votes. And that is carried. I'll move uh, first reading of items 3.12 and 3.13. Second. And sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Tang. Any questions? Please vote. We're in favor. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. Madam Chair, I'll move second reading of item 3.12 and 3.13. Second. Thank you. Please vote. In favor. In favor. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the votes. And that is carried. Madam Chair, I'll move consideration of third reading on items 3.12 and 3.13. Second. Thank you. Please vote. In favor. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. Madam Chair, I'll move third and final reading of bylaw 20082 and charter bylaw 20083. Second. Thank you. Please call the vote. In favor. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. And that is carried. Thank you. Next is bylaw 3.15. And we have Song Lin Pan. Is this to answer questions only? Is that correct? Song Lin Pen, are you with us? That speaker has just rejoined. They should be here. Hello, Song Lin Pen. Hi, I see you there. Hi. Yes, uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm I'm late because my mom has an emergency. So oh. I just yeah uh, drive her to see the doctor and just finish that. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry to hear that. We're glad to have you here. I hope everything will be okay. Um, do you have a presentation for us, or are you here just to answer questions only? Uh, I have three uh, rezoning project today, and only for one project, which is the uh, uh, woodcraft, I will have a brief uh, presentation. Uh, in, in response to the neighbor's concern and comments. Okay, we would like to hear your comments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I believe that's the 315. I, I'm uh, sorry, Song Lin Pan. Um, I'm sorry to uh, get you started. We're actually going to hear from administration first and then we'll call on you.
to hear yeah, your comments. Sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Please, thank, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. This application proposes to rezone a property in the Woodcroft neighborhood from RF1 single detached residential zone to the RF5 row house zone, which will allow for the development of ground oriented housing. The proposed RF5 zone will allow for 10 meter or approximately three story row house building with up to five dwellings or secondary suite opportunities. Next slide, please. The property is on a corner site located in the southeast corner of 139th Street and Woodcroft Avenue. It's currently occupied by a single detached house and rear garage. Vehicular access to the property is granted via the existing rear lane to the south as shown on the bottom right, uh, right hand image. Next slide, please. This property is within walking distance to a wide variety of amenities, which makes it a great location for increased density. Bus service is available along 139th Street and 115th Avenue, and the Westmount Transit Center is also within a short walk. Apart from transit service, the property and broader neighborhood area is very well served by educational and commercial amenities, um, not shown on screen, as well as Coronation Park and Westmount Shopping Center. Next slide, please. The scale of the proposed RF5 zone is appropriate for this location, as it is located on a corner and adjacent to an open site space where guidelines suggest that denser forms of infill development can be accommodated. The proposed RF5 zone also requires that average number of bedrooms per unit be at least 2.25 in an effort to encourage development that is oriented towards families. Family oriented development at this location is further complemented by the various aforementioned amenities to the that the neighborhood has to offer. To mitigate the impacts on the adjacent property, the R5 zone in combination with a mature neighborhood overlay will require window locations as well as design techniques such as translucent window treatment and screening methods to be used along the edge to help reduce overlook and other privacy issues. Next slide, please. Locating additional density adjacent to open space has remained a common approach as can be seen in the nearby neighborhood of North Lenora. Located directly south of Woodcroft neighborhood it is an excellent example of where additional density has been located adjacent to open space. As shown on screen, the Coronation School and North Glenora open spaces, which are situated within the interior of this neighborhood, support a mix of low-rise apartments identified in orange and stacked row housing identified in yellow. Next slide, please. Following advance notification to surrounding landowners, the Community League concerns were raised by a number of residents regarding the proposed RF5 zone. As such, administration took a broadened approach to engagement, which included an online public engagement session be, uh, page conducted between February 14th and 27th of this year. Concerns raised include that the density was too high, there was inadequate on-site parking. The neighborhood already had supported affordable row housing development, amongst other forms of high density development, as well as exacerbating traffic congestion. Next slide, please. The proposed rezoning supports the direction outlined in the city plan by enabling ongoing residential infill to occur at a variety of scales, densities, and designs within all parts of the residential areas and accommodating future growth to a population of 2 million within Edmonton's existing boundaries. The site is within the Westmount District Node and additional density allowed by the proposed zoning can take advantage of the wide variety of amenities this node has to offer. Next slide, please. In summary, it is the opinion of administration that this is a good location for additional density as proposed. Administration is recommended support for this application because it is located on a corner across from a park, it is well supported by amenities within walking distance, and it aligns with the infill objectives of the city plan. Thank you. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. And Mr. Mayor, would you like to take the chair now? I'll finish. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, I'll ask if anyone has any questions of administration now, or no, the speaker. Sorry, I shouldn't have my microphone on when I'm <laughs> saying that. So we'll go to the speaker, uh, Song Lin Pan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I also have a small PowerPoint. Do I need to show it? Do I need to share my screen or? Did you send the presentation to the city clerk? Uh, oh, no, I just registered, but I don't see a link to upload my presentation package. That's fine. I can maybe I can just uh, just uh, speak. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, hi everyone, my name is Song Lin. I'm the architect and the applicant for this project. And I, I want to thank the officer and thank everyone for your time to review our project. And I believe the officer's uh, presentation already uh, expressed our intention and expressed that this application, this resume application is properly for this uh, location very well. And uh, sorry, because uh, although you cannot see the uh, zoning map, but if we look at the zoning map of this area, there are some RF4, RF5, RE7, RA9 zoning in the same area. And also we have the public park, uh, public park and public and uh, language school on both the south side and the north side of this lot. Uh, as you know, this lot is a corner lot. It's very close to the intersection uh, and it is close to another RF5 zoning development, which already built many townhouses. So we believe it is a good location for the rezoning. Um, one thing that we would like to explain is, although uh, the RF5 allow us to build a five press, but the client's intention is only to build a four press because we know that uh, we want to maintain all the parking within our lot. And five press, maybe it is a bit too crowded for this lot. So our uh, our plan is to just build a four press. We already have the architecture plan, and I believe this can be put into the meeting minute. So when we uh, submit the uh, DP application for the four press in the future, then there is a record that we are not going to build a five press, but just a four press. For this pro uh, application, uh, to my surprise, we received a few uh, neighbors common, uh, which seems that they're not in that favor of the uh, rezoning. And I would just want to uh, respond to their concern. One is the site is too small to accommodate five drawing. So our intention, our intention is to build a four press, not a five drawing in the property. So it is shown in our rezoning cover letter. The lot area actually is 6,811 square feet, and it is a corner lot. It is a good size for a four press project. If we go to the city zoning uh, requirement, actually this lot is okay to develop a five press. So uh, I would say this lot is not too small to accommodate our uh, proposed uh, four press building. The second is the Jason property will experience reduced privacy and sunlight. Uh, our response is this is a corner lot. There is only road and green area and the language school north to this property and the language school is far, far away from our building. There is also road west to it. There is back alley south to our property. So only the east side, there is an existing house lot our proposed fourplex is only a two-story high, which is same as a typical house. The fourplex entry and window will be on the west side, which is facing the road. East wall will be mostly solid wall with a few transom windows. Our development will have least impact and reduction to the sunlight of, of privacy to the neighbors. The third is the, pro the property should remain zone RF1. Our response is there are already many RF4, RF5, RE7, and RE9 zoning property in this neighborhood. The next one is the proposed height of 10 meters is out character with the neighborhood. So uh, 10 meter is the maximum building height allowed, but our probe, our proposed four block will be only two story and will be the same height as the two story houses. Uh, just next to our building. Uh, the next one is the development will not be family or oriented because there is no room for backyard or adequate amenity space. Uh, actually, we will provide backyard and front yard and adequate amenity space as required by the city. But it, and if we don't apply, if we don't provide the uh, required amenity, the city will not approve our application. Next one. 
a more appropriate location would be the vacant property that was rezoned last year along 115th Avenue. Uh, we, we cannot comment because our client doesn't own this property. A uh, denser form of housing like this proposed are conductive to the physical mental health of children as their lack of green space. Thank you, there Mr. Pan. I'm sorry, your time is up, and I hope okay, uh, everything. That. Yeah, thank you, and I hope everything uh, goes well with your mother. Do we have thank any you. questions to Mr. Pan? Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thank you so much for being here, and I, I echo um, my my colleague, and especially if you're dealing with something personal and still being here, it's just even more greatly appreciated. Uh, for your time. Um, I guess one of the questions I have is another concern that I haven't heard heard addressed here, but you did mention the site is going to be a fourplex instead of a fiveplex. But right. what's the situation with, like, is there going to be garages, like off detached garages, or what's the parking situation that you're planning for that site? Yeah. We are probably, we are going to have the uh, service parking because we will, our plan is to provide a parking within our lot on the back side. This lot is 52 feet wide. It is wider than most uh, 50 feet wide lot. For many uh, 50 uh, feet wide lot, we can have the angle parking and provide a parking on the backyard. So uh, for this lot, because it, it is even wider, so we will not have any problem to provide a parking on the back side. So just if I'm, if I'm understanding correctly, there wouldn't be garages, detached garages, it would, it would be angled parking is what you're kind of thinking? Angled parking, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say that's 100% sure because there is another option is probably we will have a parking, uh, a parking garage and also we have the parking in front of the garage. But that's not very convenient because the, uh, the car within the parking, they need, within the garage, they need to get the uh, car in front of the garage move before they can move out. That's not very convenient. Although that could be one option, but I don't think that will happen. Okay. Um, and when are, are these for rental or for sale? Uh, the client hasn't uh, made the final decision. Okay. But uh, it could be if you know if the sales price is good or if the sales market is good then why not just yeah. make a profit yeah i guess i'm just because one of the the we as we've talked about is 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 the the affordable housing but i, I i'm i've experienced that infill is often not affordable so i was kind of mm -hmm. getting like, what are you anticipating getting for those properties uh you know so you, rough, you, rough estimate uh, for the selling price, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, the area, the building area is not very big. For each unit, I am thinking maybe uh, only 1,100 square feet or maximum yeah. 1,200 square feet because it's a full press. So um, I'm thinking maybe uh, it, it is not my decision. It is the client's sure, decision. Sure, no worries, no worries. Um, I'm thinking maybe around... Uh, maybe around 300K, something like that. Okay, and then my last question is about, so you're, so when you talk about the back, you're, you're planning, because there is housing on the, the east side, and you're saying that you're yeah. not gonna put windows? I, I find that hard to, okay, right. I find that, we, like, because that would be like a, pro, so you're not gonna put windows facing that, that current residential lot? Not the uh, regular window, not the big window, but the transom. You know, the transom is the, uh, the window, which is usually higher than five feet or higher than five foot six. So usually it will provide a natural light or sometimes when you open, it will have the natural ventilation, but you cannot see your neighbor. Okay. That's what we call the transom, yeah. Okay, that, yeah. That, that makes a little bit more more sense yeah okay because you know we have the south side we have the west side and the north side mm -hmm. all three sides are facing the road so we have enough space for all the window along these three sides mm -hmm. so on the east side we can only provide some transom for example for a dam for a kitchen something like that 
Okay, perfect. Those are all my questions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pan. That concludes the questions to you from uh, members of council. And next we have uh, two members of public opposed to the application. Uh, Jill uh, Sarlewis, uh, in person. Jill, if you could please come down to the, uh, to the podium. And as well as Nella Kellyhu joining us remotely. Nella Kellyhu, are you there? Good afternoon, yes I am. Thank you so much. We'll go first to uh, Jill Sar Sar Lewis. And you will have uh, five minutes to uh, make your marks and please uh, uh, keep your eyes on the, uh, on the podium for, uh, for the light, if you don't mind. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. And can you turn your mic on, please? Is that on now? Yes, on. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. I am the homeowner of the house directly adjacent to this lot. Um, so the, the proposal affects us very greatly. Uh, we have lived in this neighborhood for 22 years. We went there before we had children. We have 20-year-old twins who have only known this as their home. And it was our intention to stay here until they no longer need to live at home. Woodcroft has already a huge number of rental units. There is uh, the geared to income housing on 115th Avenue that I'm, I'm not sure how many units are there, but it is a very high density area. Um, there are several high rises. Some of them are seniors residences, but there are several high rises in the area. Um, so the need to have this one lot give four or five more units seems to me to be a waste. Our concern is that we will have a building almost right on the property line. They're saying a 1.2 meter setback. That will give us a huge wall beside our property. It will block sunlight and I hope they do the transom windows because otherwise it means that we would have no privacy in either our back or front yards. I, I have great concern as to how far the house, or the building, will go towards Woodcroft Avenue, to the north of that lot, because it would, it would come right up beside our front yard as well, blocking our view of the neighborhood. And as well, we have a 100 plus year old elm tree that is very close to the lot line and I would hate to see construction cause any damage to that tree. We have people come by and take pictures of it because it is so huge and unbelievable that it is, is still growing and, and prospering. Parking is a, a big issue in this neighborhood already because the Languages Center at Woodcroft that used to be the Woodcroft Public School, when it is operating, there is no daytime parking available on Woodcroft Avenue or around the corners on 139th Street. If I come home during the day, there is no place for me to park. If we have people over, they sometimes are parking two, three blocks away because of the parking that's already taken up by the Languages Center across the street. The mention of educational facilities, there is no elementary school in our neighborhood. Woodcroft School closed in 2008, I believe. We have a separate school, junior high, and we have a high school. There is no elementary school. So the argument that this is going to be a family, a, a young family um, occupied dwelling, to me, is not a valid argument. However, people will live where people will live. 
I think they need to take into consideration the fact that when that is a bus route, 139th Street is a bus route, so it is plowed regularly in the wintertime and a large windrow ends up along what will be the front of this building as well as the front of our, on the, on the south side of Woodcroft Avenue. We have questioned the plow operators as to why they can't put the windrow opposite on the north side of Woodcroft and they tell, tell us they are told they're not allowed to do that because the school is there. So it means we have to park on the north side. The windrow this year was above my waist. We had to dig a, a little path through it to get through it. And if we have more cars needing to park on that street, it's just going to create even more problems. The height of the building has been discussed. I'm pleased to hear that it's only going to be two stories and not the potential for three. I still feel four units is, oh, I'm yes. beeping. <laughs> Sorry about that. We have to be uh, uh, strict on the clock for everyone and to be consistent. Thank okay. you. My biggest concern is the how this will affect the value of my home. Got it. Thank you so much. We'll go next to uh, Nella Kalihu. Good afternoon. I echo a lot of uh, what the last speaker has just shared, and I, I note that a fourplex, as described by the developer, is markedly different than the 10 that we were initially um, asked for feedback on. I wanted to note, um, as the last speaker did, that there is high densification, including Matheson and Brentwoods in our neighbourhood, and that the feedback to date has been um, a high volume of exclusive, um, exclusively negative feedback to the proposal as described, um, particularly, pr particularly given um, the number of units that were originally described. And I, I wonder what the mechanism is for approval um, to the reduced scope uh, that the developer has shared today. I would also note that, that the feedback that council has uh, received via a the consultative processes that have happened to date is not from people that are against densification. People repeatedly commented in what they added that they were okay with uh, a duplex or a triplex, but anything beyond that was not supported by the lot as it is. All of the comments that the last speaker made, including high volume buses, parking, when the language school is in operation, um, are, are all accurate. And I am um, immediately uh, crisscrossed from that particular location. And so I experienced challenges with parking myself even in front of my own home. Uh, the bus route windrows and parking in winter are, are also worse. Um, the, this plan was also originally socialized as a bid for affordable housing, but it's appear it, it appears to me today that this, um, this hasn't actually been set. So, uh, I think there is an appetite on the part of City Council to look at densification as a means of addressing uh, lower income housing, but even that was not met um, in response uh, from the comments made by the developer today. So in, in closing, um, there is willingness on the part of community members from the comments that I've seen and the discussions that I've had we see a, a duplex or a triplex, but the scope that's outlined in this um, it is beyond what can be reasonably supported and what is fair and in alignment with the rest of the neighborhood. So while we welcome uh, regeneration and investment, we would ask that the city consider um, that this neighborhood, that, that things are, are congruous with this neighborhood. And also that it is an extremely settled neighbor neighborhood where people stay placed for 20, 30, 40 years, and they deserve to have their comments respectfully incorporated into this process. So thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And uh, I look forward to, to seeing how consultation um, in action results in, in a, a meeting between the two interests expressed today here. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Kelly, who for being here. Questions to uh, 
Yeah, please. Uh, well, there might be some questions from council members. So just uh, if you could stay, Councillor Rutherford. Yes, um, thank you very much. And again, I want to say the same thing I said to the other speaker about how grateful I am for your time in, in making the space and the effort to be here today. I know it's not easy and it means a lot to me that you, that you were here today for both of you. Um, I wanted to uh, start with the speaker, uh, Ms. Callahu, and you mentioned that, you know, when I w what struck me is when I read all of the comments and the letters from, from residents that, with their concerns, and I heard that presentation from the applicant, it sounds like they've, they've worked to address some of those, but you're feeling like it wasn't far enough? Am I understanding correctly? I think perhaps um, it would be useful to have an understanding of how we go from 10 proposed units to the fourplex and what formal um, what formalization of those comments happen via the application itself. So I understand that there's conversation here, but how how does the the community know that it will in fact be only four units meeting the specifications that we've discussed today? Okay. That, that gives uh, clarity. And um, in terms of Ms. Sarlius, 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 sorry about That's that, okay. it's terrible. Uh, no, thank you again for being here. And you said that your house, I wanted to, to find out, you know, get a little bit of a, a picture when you said, um, you know, that this site would be blocking both the is it blocking both your front and backyard well it's it's going to be uh, the lot in question faces 139 street we face woodcroft avenue is your mic on is it on yeah. okay yeah. okay sorry sitting too far yeah if you could please move close to the mic we um thank you our house faces north woodcroft avenue this lot faces west so the back of this fourplex will be against the side of our house. Okay. But to make that fourplex fit on the lot, it has to go further forward towards Woodcroft Avenue than the front of our house. I, I have no idea, there's no way they could fit that building on that lot without having it sticking further. All the houses on Woodcroft are relatively even along the street as far as how far back from the road they sit. This would be, have to go considerably closer to the edge of Woodcroft Avenue. Okay, but I did hear that you were, that you were happy to hear, you know, if that is in fact the height that this development stays at, the two story, that that was a relief to hear? Well, three stories was just sort of out of the, like yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Two stories, our house is two story. There's a two story house behind us and over one. The, I'm sorry, I can't remember her name. The other lady that spoke is Kitty Corner to me mm -hmm. and they have a lovely two story home. Mm -hmm. There are a handful in the immediate area that are two story homes. So, I mean, that in fact would be much more agreeable. Mm -hmm. And then what were your thoughts on the, the fact that there would be eight, there's eight parking stalls on the site? I don't know how they can possibly put eight parking stalls on that site. Yeah. I mean, it's 52 feet wide. Mm -hmm. Our lot is 52 feet wide. Yeah. Um, you could put four across. You'd have to make two rows to get eight cars on there and we all know that the vast majority of families these days especially families with young children have two cars each mm -hmm. so uh, that I don't understand yeah no I understand um but you were happy to hear there was a fourplex instead of a fiveplex as a proposed yes I still would prefer it to be a two or three I mm -hmm. still think four is is too big for Did, that lot. Are you aware that with a duplex that there can be up to six dwellings? Yes, I'm very in our zoning? aware. Because you can have a, a basement suite, the main suite, and then a garden or a garage suite? 
I realize that is legal. Yeah. However, I don't understand how a developer would feel that that is appropriate yeah. for the neighborhood and yeah. the size of the property. There will be no green space left there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate those questions. So that, that really helps. I appreciate your time again. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. R. Lewis and uh, Ms. Gallihu, for uh, your presentation and for being here and participating in the process. Uh, that concludes the questions from council members. And it, at this time, I will ask uh, if uh, uh, council members have any questions to uh, 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 on both sides uh, uh, on the information arising, right? That's the next process. Mr. Mayor, you'd ask questions of administration. Yeah, of course. There you go. It's been a while. Okay. All right. Question to the admin. Or I was in a different space. Or, or thinking about hockey, getting it done faster. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, question to the administration next, please. Who wants to go first? Councillor Rutherford, you selected this, right? So go ahead. Yeah. So uh, I, I am curious about one thing that was brought up. Um, in terms of the setbacks and from my understanding with with infill like a that's orientated the same way as a house usually the setback has to be within like isn't it one meter or so from the existing um housing right do you know what i'm do you understand what i'm trying to say i'm not a planner so i don't know if i'm getting this terminology right I'd have to check the, the, the specifics, but it has to be well, in line within, I think, plus or minus one meter of the adjacent house. Can, I you, move, check the can you move close to the mic? Sorry, can, I, can I answer this question? No, sorry, uh, Mr. Pan, you don't, would not be have, have the ability to uh, say anything at this time, uh, but okay. we will come back later on if council okay. members have any Thank questions. You. Thank you. Or Plus or minus 1.5 meters of the adjacent. So is this, if this row house is now turned in a different direction and is going lengthwise this way, mm -hmm. does that setback still fall? That if the front of their house is here, okay. is that gonna jut out significantly farther than it would if it was like a skinny or a duplex that was built on that lot? The front is still the front of the lot. So so it was still can't, that setback, the length of the, the, the row from, from one side to the other cannot be farther than that 1.5 meters. 1.5 meters beyond where the yep. existing house yep. is, yes. Yep. Okay, okay, that's, um, that's, that's helpful. And um, what kind of, so it, it comes up often, and I think even council has grappled with this question before in terms of what we hear from a, the intent of a developer at public hearing and then when they do the development permit would actually comes comes about and and it, it comes down to that broken trust right and and the format of our public hearings are the formats of our public hearings um, what mechanisms if any do we have in place so that if that developer says today they're doing a fourplex and not a fiveplex or they're building it to a certain height that we can or won't be able to hold them to that thank you councillor rutherford um that that's accurate um they are able to build within the allowable zone um, we do our analysis based on the maximum build-up potential of that zone for that very reason. Uh, however, I mean, it is up to the applicant what their intent is, but that's not the focus of our analysis and not what the basis of our support is based on. But I do know in the past that we have sort of taken notes, and I maybe I'll turn to Ms. Petron, but we have taken notes before of what has been articulated by the developer. Is there any kind of notes that go on file around that, or am I completely? Councillor Rutherford, you're correct. Um, in the past, when there has been conversations at public hearing, we have followed up with a letter to the applicant or the owner, just articulating any commitments that were made in public hearing. However, when it comes to uh, the RF5 uh, zone in this case, that is their development rights. And so that's one thing to consider. Um, we do have uh, other tools in the bylaw in terms of a direct control or a site-specific zone that can be used when greater certainty or control is needed on an, on an application. But in this case, the RF5 zone is an appropriate zone for this site. And would that um, 
with that R, was that RF5 evaluation done with detached garages as the, the image and the presentation demonstrated? Yes, it was. Okay, so it, you, you're saying as administration that you assess that that site is big enough for five, row, for five housing units plus five detached garages, a single car? The, the garages are attached to each other. Oh, yeah. Um, but detached from the, the detached, primary Detached, yeah, yes. but still single car garages. Correct. Yeah, okay. So, so Councillor, just to add, the, the analysis was done on uh, that full impact of the zone. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be five yep. car parks or car garages um, or five units for that matter, but the maximum built volume of that building. But am I correct in, underst in my understanding that if it was, let's say, a duplex that was built there, they could do, up, that developer could do up to six units? Correct. separate units right that is correct yep. and in the past have we had row housings that have been uh, referred back and then come back as higher developments higher density is, is that a risk here I mean we we're assessing the application on hand we have seen similar sites as shown in North Glenora that um, are similarly placed in proximity to the park spaces that are um, four stories or, or, or in low-rise apartments Okay, thank I can't, you. Yeah, sorry, I can't speak to the. No, I just like historically has that happened, right? So was my question perfect? That's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford, Councillor Salvador. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and um, just a few follow-up questions from some of the concerns that were raised from some of our speakers. Uh, so, just to administration, um, could you could you just briefly uh, outline the tree protection um, that we have in place? I know that there were some concerns raised around um, the importance of protecting. Uh, some large elm trees. Thank you for that question, Councillor Salvador. Um, there is a requirement that all public trees be protected, and there is guidelines around how that should be set up, the distance um, and the approval via forestry in order to cross any boulevard that has one. Um, that being said, those are publicly available, and so if that is something that the developer wanted to agree to, they could certainly work with the applicant on protecting the private trees. Um, the, the information is available, but it's certainly not a requirement of the zone. Okay, okay, and just, do we, do we not have something coming forward around uh, tree protection on private property as well? Am I mistaken? Councillor Salvador, uh, we have a report around tree protection of private, trees on private property coming to Urban Planning Committee in June. Okay, okay, gotcha. Um, all right, well, I appreciate the answers there. I also wanted to ask about, um, I guess, how, how relevant questions of tenure are uh, when we're talking about, you know, rental versus ownership. I know some concerns were raised about there being sort of a large proportion of rental units already in the neighborhood, but I, my understanding is that can't factor into our decisions um, in a public hearing. Is that right? Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Those are not included in our analysis. I'll, I'll let someone else weigh in on uh, whether or not they're appropriate for Council to ask. Councillor, this is Jamie Johnson from, from Legal Services. You're correct. We, we generally very strongly discourage away from an analysis between rental or ownership of properties as well as uh, rental rates and what's not. We are looking at the uses of the land as compared to the users. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you for, for that additional clarity. Um, and then just back to sort of, yeah, that, that comment around um, there already being a, a significant uh, degree of density in the neighbourhood. Um, I'm wondering... You know, is is Woodcroft similar to other mature neighborhoods where um, over the past, you know, 30, 40 years, we have seen that population decline? There was mention of uh, Woodcroft School being closed. Um, is it sort of a similar story where there wasn't enough population to actually sustain those those schools? Do we know? Sorry, I don't. Uh, the school boards would make the decision on whether or not there's significant population. Right, right. I guess I'm wondering, you know, when we talk about infill, when we talk about densification, it's making sure that we have enough people to actually sustain the amenities that, that people rely on. Um, and oftentimes, you know, we, we see uh, charts or maps of population change. Maybe that's a better question. Yeah. Has Woodcroft experienced similar uh, declines in population over the last 40 years? Woodcroft has seen declines in populations in the past. Um, and I would say with the new direction from the city plan and the uh, introduction of a district node in this location, um, that should be a, um, a way to catalyze some of these local amenities. This is certainly a very rich um, community in terms of amenities that they have access to, as well as it being well served by transit. So I think this yeah. is 
indicative. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that. Um, and just one final one, just around affordability. Uh, you know, we talk about infill and affordability. Uh, there's there's often that tension. Um, we often hear that folks have a bit of discomfort going beyond uh, things like dupe duplexes or triplexes. But in order to get into that sort of missing middle affordability range, um, are we not are we not trying to aim a little bit higher? Um, and are there affordability benefits to be gained by going a, a little bit higher into that middle range? Again, in terms of um, what we did the analysis on, we really are looking at built form and uses, not on the affordability of the specific project. Um, however, I would say that this location, um, given its proximity to the amenities and access to transit, would certainly enable uh, a variety of different uh, folks to occupy its space. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate those answers. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Stevenson. Great. Well, yeah, I think there's been some really great clarity provided already in terms of that front lot line setback or the front setback. Um, I did hear the question just around, again, sort of how it was advertised initially being up to potentially 10 units. Um, and, and my understanding is that that exercise is a, is a very um, mathematical one rather than any sort of true test fit about what would be reasonable site, you know, unit layouts on that site. Is that, is that correct? That is correct, although we do try and make sure that it's something that would feasibly fit, uh, mm -hmm. whether or not the performa is there to back that, um, we don't consider. Okay, perfect. And then, you know, I really appreciate the point from, from the speaker around privacy and um, including the transom windows. And so um, I believe there's, there's some pretty strong assurances provided through the MNO, which applies uh, to this site. That is correct, Councillor. Great. So, so that would uh, require the development to have raised windows or other approaches that uh, that would would protect that privacy there. Okay. Thank you. Just with the with the elm tree as well, if if there were to be if this were to come through as a Class B permit, is there any opportunity to condition the protection of the the tree on private land adjacent? So that, that tree is on the adjacent property. Um, you can't condition a, a right. permit uh, for a specific piece of land on a different uh, site. Right. However, uh, because it is on that other property, um, you can't necessarily start constructing on that property unless it's been allowed by that property owner as well. Okay. And then, and, and presumably as well, uh, you know, the work that's done through the infill compliance team, they would be looking for the site condition, looking for... Uh, again, if that, that construction was encroaching on adjacent properties and, and potentially impacting that tree? That is correct. All of the standards that are in place would apply to this construction build. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, well, thank you. I think that, that answered all of my questions and appreciate the, the information. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Tang? Yeah, just a, uh, a small question. Normally, I feel like with the administration report, there is a section on shadow studies. Um, since that did come up, um, but it's not in this one. Just wondering if you can speak to that analysis. Uh, just at a high level, typically a shadow study isn't done for uh, low-scale development uh, because the height in question here is very similar to what could be built today under the existing zoning. Uh, it's 1.1 meters taller, uh, so there would be a marginal increase in shadowing uh, of the building next door. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. So that concludes our questions to the administration. Now I will ask council members if they have any questions for the information, new information arising out of this, these discussions. Right. Councillor Rutherford. Yes, I just have one further quick question for Mr. Pan. Is he still on the line? Yes, I'm on the line. So in your original presentation, you didn't discuss, um, you know, tree protection and, and heard the concerns about, and I, and I echo that, that it, you know, it is a shame when we lose those beautiful mature trees. Um, would you be willing to work with the adjacent property to protect that tree? Absolutely. And, you know, also the city, they have the tree protection plan. So every time when we start construction and there are existing trees in the front yard, uh, we need to prepare, provide a tree protection plan. Sometimes, for example, we need to build a fence uh, to, uh, to protect the tree. And also uh, all the construction truck, they need to be uh, running uh, away from that. And for this law, I think it will be much easier because this is a corner law. There is back alley, there is uh, a row on the north side and on the 
website. So I don't believe the construction truck need to uh, approach or even close to that tree to finish the construction. But uh, the city, for sure, the city's landscape department or the, uh, tra the transportation department, they will have the requirement for the tree protection. Yeah, well, that's exactly the challenge that we're up against because that tree protection is for trees on public property. Mm -hmm. But this elm tree with the speaker um, that was speaking previously, the adjacent neighbor was talking about one that they're concerned about on their on their private property. So I'm, you know, again, looking to you to confirm that you would use those same standards of protection, even oh, though see. it's not on public property. Yeah, absolutely. And as I mentioned, probably our construction vehicle or the equipment doesn't need to get close to their property. And also, I would like to, uh, I, I would like to explain that if the uh, neighbors, their concern is about the size setback, actually, uh, four plus is provide more size setback than a single family house or duplex. Single family house or duplex, the size setback is only 1.2 meter. However, if we look at the RF5, the uh, side setback when a lot is at the corner lot, uh, the side setback actually is three meters. So that means our building, our fourplex, need to be minimum three meters away from the property line in between the two property. So if in terms of side setback and the sun, the, the sunshine shading, actually the uh, five the fourplex is even better than a duplex or a single family house. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That's all my questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I can also, if there's no other speakers, I can close the public yeah. hearing. So that concludes the uh, the discussion, and we are ready to close the public hearing. So, Councillor Rutherford, I move the closure of the public hearing. We second. need a second. A second by Councillor Salvador. All right, please vote for the closing of the public hearing on this bylaw. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councilor Rutherford. Yeah, I move first reading of item 3.15. Second. Second by Councilor Salvador. Yes, and we, here we go, Councillor Rutherford to speak. Yeah, I just, I just want to take a few minutes to speak. I think it's, it's really important in, in these kind of situations. But I, when I've heard from the developer and I've heard from the concerns and, and the, the concerns that have come in and I've read from other residents in Woodcroft um, leading up to this public hearing, I feel that the developer's actually done a fairly good job of working to address those while also balancing the need to continue to move forward with the city plan, recognizing this is an ideal site for densification, recognizing that, um, you know, the risk of potentially referring this back could mean something even higher density because, like it said, it is when one of those primary nodes and corridors that through district planning might even be something that is a four story down the road if we were not to do it as a row house now. So you could end up with something even larger, potentially. Um, and so that's stuff that I'm thinking about. I do hope that um, the letter is sent to the developer with some of the commitments that have been made here. I did debate whether it needs to be a DC1 to protect that tree, to protect um, those commitments. But I, I feel that in good faith that that developer is really wanting to work with community and be a good neighbor and um, and I and I hope to see that in action and so I will be supporting this bylaw today and um, I know it's hard uh, but that does not mean that your concerns were not heard they are heard and I hope they continue to be heard and worked with throughout this process and please keep me informed of how that is going um, so I can know uh, the outcomes of that. So thank you again for everyone for being here today and, and taking the time to share it and for all those that couldn't be here but submitted their comments um, to the website through email 
to me and to my other council colleagues, I just want to say thank you. I know when it's in your home, it, it, it is really significant and your time and effort to express your concerns is not falling on deaf ears. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Please vote on the first reading. We're missing one vote, Councillor Jans. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor Rutherford. I move second reading of item 3.15. Second. Second by Councillor Salvador. Please vote for the second reading. <clears throat> we have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I move consideration of third reading for item 3.15. Second. Thank you, Councilor Salvador. Consideration for third reading, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I move third and final reading for bylaw 20087. Second. Second by Councilor Salvador. Please vote for the final reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, now we are going into our next item, 3.16, right, Madam Kirk? Yes, that's correct. All right, is there a presentation from administration or is it needed? Councillor, Councillor Rice, you exempted this, right? Uh, yes. Do you, yes. Need, do you need a presentation? Uh, I do not need any presentation. I just have a very quick few uh, questions to administration. Okay, so before you do that, I'll ask Mr. Uh, Jeet Nair if uh, you're only here to co answer questions only, right? That's right. Okay. All right, and Councillor Rice, do you have any questions to Mr. Nair? Um, no. Okay, all right, then we'll go to administration. Go ahead, Councillor Rice. Okay, so I just ha have a few clarifications regarding this bylaw. Uh, the first one, and I just want to make sure my understanding is uh, is correct uh, from the report. Um, this uh, site development is located in commercial commercial area, uh, so it's not in residential area, right? That's correct. Uh, so uh, is that? Uh, fair to say there is no school, no playground, and no daycare around this site. Um, there is no public lands within 100 meters of this site. And that uh, follows the separation distance that would be triggered at a development permit stage. Uh, I just want to... Uh, clarify my question again, and then if this site is located in commercial area, uh, is that safe to say there is no school around because it's commercial area and no playground around and no daycare around and close to this door? Councillor Rice, I can confirm there's no um, school, there is no park, um, daycare, I would have to uh, double check. Um, if I could just ask the clerks to bring up the presentation uh, so we could see slide six. It, it will help uh, Councillor Rice to have a visual. Um, we have a map that just shows the location of other um, cannabis retailers in the area and it also shows the location of any um, community or, or public lands, which would include uh, school, um, schools. So I don't, I don't need Sorry, I have to mind my, my time. I don't need that presentation. I just okay. want to see confirmation and then if this is the commercial area okay. and it is not our residential area, uh, we don't have school nearby and we don't have a uh, playground nearby. We don't have daycare around. Uh, I just want that confirmation before my, I make decision. 
Councillor, there is no school or uh, playgrounds within the required separation distances of the Kansas retail. However, uh, the daycare we did not measure because that is not one of the sensitive uses that cannabis is uh, to be separated from. So that is, hasn't been part of our analysis. Uh, do we have that awareness during the daycare around this? We, we do not. Uh, okay. Um, so the next question, uh, is there any other uh, cannabis store just around this store? Not within the required separation distance. So not within 200 meters of where this use would be. Uh, but uh, do we have the different stores? Do we, could you repeat the question? Do we have? Uh, do we do we have like the, even though we're not talking about the standard, we're not talking about separation distance. I just want to know in this area, do we have a larger cannabis store already exist? So, Councillor Rice, if you could see the map on the screen, the areas yeah. highlighted in the bright green, those are the locations of current cannabis retailers in and around the site. Okay. Okay, in the uh, green spot. That's right, the really bright green. Uh, okay, so uh, another question is about uh, bus stop nearby. Uh, is there any specific impact and for any like cannabis store and if we have the bus stop nearby? Uh, there's frequent transit in the area. This is located right at uh, 100th Ave um, yeah. in between Stony Plain and 170th Street, the high commercial, high transit area. Um, yeah. I mean, people can get there by car or, or by bus. Is that, does that help answer your question? Um, no, it's not. And because I really tried to get the sense of how the bus stop nearby the cannabis store, is there any specific uh, impact and from in environment perspective or from other perspectives? and for this site development. Councillor Rice, if I can add, uh, there, there is a bus service as mentioned along 100th Avenue and there is a bus stop right at the intersection of 170th Street and 100th Avenue. Yes, uh, that is what I saw and in the report. Uh, um, okay, um, the last question, the last question is about uh, the 10 notice and the out only for the pub for the community inside perspective is because this number is very low is because of this site is located in a commercial area is that the reason that's correct <laughs> okay uh i think that is all my questions and to the administration but i am ready to speak to this uh, Bye, Thank you, Councillor Rice. So that concludes the questions to administration. And any further questions to uh, any questions to uh, Mr. Nair on the information arising? Councillor uh, Cartmel? I have no questions. Oh, sorry. I thought, sorry. Okay. Uh, no questions arising out of this, right? So. Uh, and uh, I'll go to Councillor Nack to you. close the bylaw. Yeah, I'll move closure of the public hearing for item 3.16. Second. Second by Councillor Cartmel. Please vote on the closing of this bylaw. Public hearing closing bylaw. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I'll move first reading of item 3.16. Second. Second by Councillor <laughs> Cartmel. We have first reading, so Councillor Rice to speak. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm going to say uh, no and to support this bylaw. Uh, the reason for that is based on the question I asked, uh, but I didn't get the information and um, for the daycare question. And then even though daycare is not on the list for our uh, rezoning bylaw and for the separation distance, but I think uh, for me to make that decision and then to include that information, is there any daycares nearby and it still really be helpful. And so based on this information is locked, 
uh, I cannot give this information to be confirmed, but I appreciate administration confirmed other type of information, low school uh, nearby and no program nearby. And so thank you for that. And so I just quickly uh, do this speech. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Plaquette. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll be voting in favor of this because the report answered all my questions. And uh, just as an example, um, Right down the road from my house, there's a shopping mall, a little outdoor shopping mall, and uh, it's got a burger joint, it's got uh, 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 a liquor outlet, it's got uh, a pharmacy, doctor's office, a daycare, and a cannabis store, among other things. And somehow the community is functioning. So I will be voting in favor of this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Mack to close. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. And, and you know, I, I didn't know if I could ask a question. I know the answer to the question about the daycare, so I was just going to speak it, even though I know it's not a use that we, we've we identified as a council through the zoning bylaw. So there's a daycare about 550 meters away, about three blocks away, um, uh, well well outside of the range that, that we have typically set for ourselves as a council for, uh, for schools and parks. And I know we haven't included daycares in the past, but appreciating one of our uh, colleagues was interested in that. I just thought I would share that as a bit of detail. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is uh, this is uh, since there was notification to the Glenwood Community League and they are a very, very engaged community league. Their president is their civics director and uh, he and I have chatted many times over the years and they're a community that is not afraid to speak up when they have concerns. Uh, but they're also, uh, if they don't, they, they don't register, they don't, they purposely don't speak up. So I know they haven't uh, had any issues with this particular application. Uh, I think this makes a, this is a, a re very reasonable location for a use like that. But I just wanted to make sure everyone had that information. So I'll be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Please vote on the first reading. have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mr. Mayor, I'll move second reading of item 3.16. Sorry, second. Second by Councilor Cartmel. Please vote on the second reading. We're, we have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mr. Mayor, I'll move consideration of third reading on item 3.16. Second. Please vote for the consideration of third reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Consideration is granted. And Mr. Mayor, I'll move uh, third reading. That's how I do this job. Uh, Charter Bylaw 20078. Second. Second by Councillor Cartmel. Please vote for the final reading. We have all the votes. That display the votes, please. That is carried. All right. Now we're heading into our next item, three point two one two two one. Right. Uh, Councillor by selected by Councillor Principe, Charter Bylaw two zero zero five nine. That's, that's the one? 3.20. Oh, 3.20 is uh, both? Oh, I see, both of them. Okay, they're together. Got it. Okay. And let me see if we have speakers. All right, Councillor uh, Principal, do you need a presentation? Yes, please. Okay, administration, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tim Ford will be providing the presentation over the internet. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Uh, Charter Bylaw 20059 proposes to rezone a site in the Clarvatten neighborhood to the RLD, RA8, PU and AP zones to allow for single detached housing, multi-unit medium rise apartment housing, a stormwater management facility and park uses, an associated amendment to the Clarvatten NSP under bylaw 20058 also accompanies this proposal. Next slide, please. The 11.5 hectare vacant site is located west of 82nd Street, south of Anthony Henday Drive in the northeastern portion of the neighborhood. 
There is an east-west linear park through the site under the AP zone that is intended to provide both a pedestrian and ecological connection. Next slide, please. The surrounding lands to the west are zoned for resident, residential development, but are largely undeveloped, while land to the south is mostly developed with a mix of single and semi-detached dwellings. Next slide, please. The proposed rezoning and amendments are compatible with the surrounding existing residential uses and the proposed RE8 zone will provide a logical transition between the RE7 site to the south, which also acts as a buffer with the existing single family homes further south. Next slide, please. The associated plan amendment to allow for the proposed zoning reconfigures the stormwater management facility. It adds a pocket park it adjusts the boundary of low density residential uses and medium density residential uses, as well as removing a connection to the transportation and utility corridor. The reconfigured dry pond will provide programmable park space, including a soccer pitch for community uses. To improve the overall connectivity of the open space network and respond to communal concerns, sorry, community concerns about insufficient park space, a pocket, a pocket park is proposed south of the storm pond Overall, the proposed density and housing mix for the neighborhood remain largely unchanged from the original plan. Next slide, please. Advance notice was sent to just under 1,400 surrounding property owners and two community leagues. 25 responses expressing concern about the application were received. Additionally, a public engagement session was held in October of last year by the Engaged Edmonton Online Forum and 18 responses expressed expressed opposition out of 108 that we were aware of the application. One of the primary concerns received from affected property owners was related to traffic generation, pedestrian safety, and potential parking problems, particularly with the two medium density sites. As well, there were some concerns addressed about the informal recreation space and the disruption to the ecological network in the area. If approved, the application will provide residential lots that are compatible with existing and planned uses provides housing, housing and open space amenities to support the growing population in Edmonton and allows for the sequential development and the completion of the neighborhood. Administration supports these bylaws and that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ford, for the presentation. We have Amy Stewart to answer questions only. Amy, are you there? Okay, there you are. And, uh, and we also have uh, two members of public in opposition. Ivan Babiak, in person? No. Ivan, are you online? Uh, I'm phoning in remotely. Okay, got it. And uh, Farley, you're us? Farley, you're here? All right, so we are at 327. We won't be able to, uh, I don't want to break in between, so we'll take a break early and come back uh, at, uh, uh, you know, 
Yep. We ready to go? Good. All right. Thank you so much. I would like to call this meeting back to order and do a quick roll call. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Prince Bay. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Councilor Salvador. Good afternoon. Councilor Cartmel. <laughs> Councilor Rice. Here. Councilor Jans. Good afternoon. Good. All right. So we. I'm here. I'm here, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Hamilton. Okay. Now we got a presentation. We're going to go to members of the public, and I will see. Uh, Mr. Uras, if you could come to the uh, podium, please, or uh, to the front. And uh, I will go first to Mr. Babiak. You have five minutes to make your presentation. Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody at the city for allowing me the chance to speak today. Uh, so regarding the proposed rezoning changes to Corbatton, uh, particularly having any sort of RA7 low-rise apartment or RA8 medium-rise apartment zone. And I really want to talk about how the increase in population and uh, vehicular traffic, along with inadequate infrastructure, is really affecting the quality of life, uh, but more importantly, the safety of our community. Um, as new homes are built, including the ones in Crystalina, uh, we've noticed that 91st Street and 180th Ave have become really busy and, in fact, fairly dangerous. When you add in the curvature of the roadway, poor sight lines, you know, this has led a lot of drivers to run the stop signs and the yield signs as they try to enter onto those roadways. Speeding, you know, also because we see the roadways being used as a shortcut between Corbatten and Crystalina. You know, we've also got a lot of, uh, we have a lack of marked crosswalks and crossing lights. So, you know, it's really dangerous for a lot of our pedestrians and bikers and people like that. You know, when you review the layout of the road access from the proposed apartment buildings to enter onto 180th Street, you know, anybody that lives here can clearly see that the road is narrow and it's only going to exacerbate the issue of adding that extra traffic to our roadways. And over the last few years, as more and more homes are being put up in both neighborhoods, you know, I've seen numerous close calls, uh, you know, from, you know, people with young kids crossing the street, families, uh, close uh, collision calls, you know, by just that increase in traffic along with what I've laid out previously. Um, but where does this kind of leave me? So for me, um, these close calls became a reality for me and my family on October 5th, 2021. Uh, so my wife was out for a morning walk uh, to meet up with a friend in our neighborhood. And as she was crossing uh, the curvature where 91st Street turns into 180th Ave, uh, she was struck and run down by a Dodge Ram 1500 that ran a yield sign. So she was rushed to the U of A hospital and spent a week in the trauma ward with the following injuries. She had a severe concussion, a brain hematoma, bruised heart, pulmonary embolism, three fractured vertebrae, four pelvic fractures, 
which now means that she's considered high risk if we were to have a child. Um, road rash on both hips and thighs, uh, multiple bruises, cuts, including a head laceration with uh, some internal brain bleeding. Uh, so she has a long road to recovery and now faces a lot of mental health issues, you know, as she's terrified of our neighborhood, terrified of walking in it, and also she's scared to drive. Um, so <clears throat> that being said, you know, I really want to tell my story to say that, you know, we really have to, you know, think about the safety of our people first and foremost when we make any decision, whether to rezone an area, put up uh, new apartment buildings, new houses, all of that. I also understand that due to the population growth, the city of Edmonton is looking at more affordable housing densification through Intel. But really, should we not be looking at additional changes and enhancements to the existing infrastructure first before we go ahead with anything? Um, and I also kind of want to add, too, that, uh, you know, I can appreciate the Safe Crossing Program initiative. And I have seen two curb extensions put into my neighborhood. So thank you for that. But should we not also have some sort of uh, lights installed as well to notify our drivers that there's somebody about to cross the road? Um, and is there a budgetary decision to exclude those? Uh, if anybody's been in St. Albert, you know, you've seen those curb extensions along with those full lights, you know, those LED lights that you can easily install. So first and foremost, and really the end of what I wanted to say is that, you know, I just want to ensure that this doesn't happen again and that, uh, you know, we need to think about our community and the safety of our citizens uh, first and foremost. So thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll next go to Mr. Uras. Yes, good day. Um, I pretty much can echo what that gentleman said. We live right on the... Uh, the map isn't up there anymore, but we live right on the edge. And uh, the main problem, no matter, and it's not going to matter what they do, the main problem is going to be the access in and out of there. There is no good access. They can't go into 82nd Street, there's a bridge there, and there's, and you're gonna, there's people going there all the time with hot rods and motorcycles and all this stuff now anyhow, but it's not a real driveway. They're gonna have to go through major residential areas. And if, if the council was to go up there and see where they were going to have to put every single person who's going to have one or two cars per household, or maybe more when the kids get older, they're all going through a short residential area where there's street parking. And you've got to feel sorry for parents with kids who have to worry every single time now when there's not as much traffic. They're going to be terrified because I have seen people drive in that area. And, and I know I don't know if it's the city who does it or the police, but... We've always got that little yellow van there because people, it's a driveway. And then we live at the corner of 84th Street. 85th Street is one of the major access points to that. There is street parking there and one lane in the middle, one lane. If they're using that at all, those people are hooped. They can't park on the street. They get the very little parking there, park on the major road. And then you have 180th Avenue which you can't put a stoplight in, well, I guess you could put a stoplight there, but now you've got one lane of traffic coming through a residential area, which will be backed up three, four, six, eight, ten, which blocks everyone from moving there. That is the major concern we have. It's not going to affect our quality of life except for the noise complaints, which are always going to come when you get a buildings like that. But the main thing is the, the added stress on the utilities, the way people drive, our access to our own homes with the added traffic and I'm that's the major worry we have is the added traffic and and I we see no reason that it's a three-story apartment building that it's been zoned for now I don't see any reason to make it a six-story building and all the other things that they're putting in there and just as an aside it was very disheartening this week because we have this meeting and what shows up three days ago the bulldozers and the diggers and everything it's like a slap in the face. Yeah, you can go to the meeting, but we're going to do this now because we can't wait until at least after the meeting is over. That was really distressing to me to see those guys out there working before I even had a chance to say anything. So that is 
and there's a lot of people on our block. The lady next door to me couldn't come because her husband just passed away and stuff. There's a lot of people who are really concerned, but middle of the afternoon is difficult. So thank you for listening to me. I appreciate the time. Thank you so much for being here. And I'll go to questions uh, from council members. Please le uh, stay there, Mr. Your Mr. Uras, you, there might be some questions to you from council members, if you don't mind staying there. Councillor Knack? Uh, Sorry, I'll go to Councillor Principe. Yes. Councillor Principe? Uh, thank you, Mr. Uras, for uh, coming in today. I appreciate that, and I understand your concerns. And I know, actually, Councillor Knack came along with me, and I took him to show him the area and uh, explain the concerns that the community has. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, you had mentioned that um, uh, the utilities, you were concerned that the utilities would also be a factor, that do you believe that the there won't be enough, um, um, what, uh, like, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Like, are you concerned that there's going to be utility I'm problem? Even, I'm, I'm not really sure that I, the correct word was utility. Sorry, I have to move here because you're in the middle of there. But, yeah. <laughs> I'm not really sure utilities was the correct wordage. I was, I was on a roll and I just kept moving my mouth without engaging my brain. But um, the, the major problem is the increase in traffic. And you can put in all the protocols you want. You know, there's protocols that stop people from going through red lights. But you know what happens? People go through red lights. So protocols are nice, making it safe, putting a little extra here and there. But basically, if you have a six-story building, and I have no idea how many units are going to be in there, but if there's 50 units, that's anywhere between 50 and 100 vehicles just for that, and then you want other developments there. And then in the zoning map that I saw before, we have these cute, really, really small little green areas for us to go and just walk and, and stand and sit because they're not going to be very big for that area. And then that big is, it, you've got Anthony Hendy on one side and you've got 82nd Street, which thank goodness we don't have access to the Anthony Hendy because it keeps the big trucks off there. But they can't take a road over there because that's right where the bridge is. That would be a disaster. So they've got to go through residential. And nothing to do with this council, I'm sure, but when this whole thing was passed, we moved in there 10 years ago, when this whole thing was passed, didn't they look ahead and say, well, even if we build up, we're going to still, if we're going to put the, and it was zoned for it, didn't they think maybe we should make the streets wider? Or, I mean, it doesn't seem like planning was done 10 years ago because this happens a lot. They, they rezone a lot. Anyway, sorry, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, you <laughs> did. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And um, yes. now from what I, all the reading that I did, and, um, you know, administration had mentioned that, this application aligns with the goals and policies of the city plan. But from what I see, the current the current plan that we have, also it looks to me like it would align with the city plan. Now, from what I can see, the changes would be from what's actually approved now to what it could be, or sorry, to what it's proposed. Um, actually, the proposal is almost looks better than what's zoned right now. So there would be actually a decrease in medium density housing but and an increase in... They still want to put up, they still want to move that apartment building from three to six correct. stories. Yes, that's correct. So where does the decrease come? The decrease is because the larger area uh, of in the zoning is actually right now zoned for an RA7. And that would go, now it's proposed to be a lower density zoning. So we might actually see a decrease in density with well, the proposal. Okay, yeah. And if, if that's the case, not, not disputing what you're saying, yeah. but if that's the case, then it behooves City Council to let the residents in that area, because I don't know what's going on in, in Mill Woods or anything. I just, mm -hmm. I'm living where I'm living. So I think it behooves City Council to make sure that you educate us in the area and let us know because our concern is traffic and you well, say Karen, yeah. I mean you're our you're our representative yes yeah and and uh, you know what it's like in there and so I if I, I we'd like to know mm -hmm. how you're going to make it so that the traffic isn't going to drive everyone crazy and 
have an increase in the possibility of hitting kids on bikes and stuff like that because it's so congested. That's the main worry about that. Right, and I understand. That's always my, one of my concerns as well as of all my council colleagues and the administration. That's always a concern of ours. Um, just what, we're, what we have in front of us today is the proposal for rezoning. And the way the rezoning is, uh, I, and I actually have some numbers here where the proposal is actually, um, will be less density than the actual uh, zoning as it stands right now. So uh, it, maybe you can think on that and uh, I, I'll probably be coming back for another round and then we can possibly discuss this further, okay? Thank that you. That would be good, I appreciate that, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Principe. If you could take the chair, I have just to step away for a minute. Okay, I'll take the chair. I'm here if you need another round, Councilor Principe. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. <laughs> Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, and actually, that was my one set of questions you've asked. I just maybe wouldn't mind asking a similar question to Mr. Babia if, if he's still on the line. Um, because, yeah, that, that was my read of this uh, rezoning application is that this is actually a net decrease to density. So based off what I heard and, and uh, your very tragic incident, I'm so, so sorry to hear about what happened to, to your wife. Uh, and the concerns you raise seem to be better addressed by this because it actually decreases the amount of developments in the area. So I just wanted to double check if, if you had seen it that way and, and if not, uh, knowing this information now, does that uh, change how you sort of view this? Well, uh, I'll add this, is that uh, part of the change is that we were looking to have, when we got the original notice, I know we're talking about having uh, you know, when you look at the numbers, it's a very small decrease. So we're talking uh, like a dozen units. So that really is negligible to say that it's worse. We're talking like a fraction of a percentage from what I've seen. But when you start to look at adding in uh, additional shops, uh, things like that, other sort of businesses, that doesn't actually decrease the density, that increases the density that you have, you know, throughout your day from your nine to five day or your nine to nine uh, schedule when all those kinds of things are open. So that's kind of where I see it's actually more of an increase if you're going to have those people coming in from other neighborhoods to use those facilities as well. And really, when you kind of look at the types of facilities that we're getting into these kinds of um, areas, I mean, they don't add any value to, you know, what we're looking for in a community. Nobody needs another uh, nail salon or going air shop or something like that, right? So, you know, if it was something family-oriented, then you'd find more champions to those kind of businesses coming in. So, um Long story short, that's where I see there's a bit of a disagreement because when you do bring the businesses in, you have a lot more traffic coming in. Okay, so, and that's, all. Th that, that's helpful. I, I just want to double check, and I, I might be misreading the, the report and that will likely come up during questions of our administration, but my understanding is the way that the, the change in those units that I think you said uh, suggested almost, I think it was 28 units um, to be exact, was specifically for the one site, but the net change in reduction, so there's a, there's a net increase in low density residentials uh, of just of 0.81 hectares and a net decrease of medium density residential of, of 0.86 hectares. And my understanding is that change is, is more significant than the 32 units. Um, but I'll, I'll check with that on administration at the time. But I, my, my understanding is that that's a pretty sizable change in terms of net density. So we're not talking about a 32 unit change in the over, that, that was for one part of the overall parcel of land that's being discussed today. So, um, so I guess I just maybe to, 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 maybe I'm wrong and I very well could be, I've, I've been right, wrong many times before. Um, but, but if that is in fact a, a correct interpretation that this would be far more of a change in a reduction, I just wanted to make sure I I got your thoughts on that because because there's such a the the amount of land that was available to be RA seven in the current application is is a huge parcel a huge a multiple huge parcels now that's all low density residential and then there's one increase of the small parcel of land so I I guess I just wanted to double check that that I, I could be misunderstanding this and I, I imagine your counselor will ask those questions of administration but. Assuming that is in fact the case that there's a big shift, I wanted to make sure I got your feelings on this. 
Yeah, just looking at the uh, two appendices, or it shows the amount of dwellings that we have uh, from appendice two to appendice three. And, you know, this is my first time uh, getting in front of you folks, Absolutely. so forgive me. Uh, when I see a total residential of 2226, and, you know, for appendix 3, we're going up to 2,232. So to me, when I look at those kinds of numbers, it looks negligible. And then also when you look at uh, the population, you know, we're going from 7,335 to 7,361. Um, looking at the agenda that was sent out to us. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. No, that, that's fair. I just wanted to make sure I was... Because I, I get what you're asking for, and I just want to make sure that we're not, you know, if, if by chance this were defeated, are we actually creating a worse situation for you based off your particular concerns? And so we'll make sure we, uh, that'll get likely asked of administration. So thank, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Councillor Paquette, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. Thank you. I can speak, Councillor Paquette. Oh, of course. Thank, Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Babiak, um, as we were discussing, you were ta uh, talking about the appendices. I was also looking at those, and I was uh, noticing the density. So, uh, I'm trying to understand. You're concerned about the population increase from the propose from the um, current to the proposal. Is that correct? The population. Correct. You know, they're, they're, to me, when I look at the appendices, there's really no negligible change. Um, but, you know, when you're looking at, you know, packing in an apartment building, you know, that's a high rise, that's going to be kind of a little more, um, I guess, closer to a certain roadway that ends where you kind of have one path in, one path out. You know, are we better off having that? Or are we better off, like uh, the councillor on the previous uh, had mentioned, are we better off having something more spread out? So, you know, <clears throat> that's kind of how I see it, right? Is, uh, yeah, I'm rambling a little bit here. Sorry, guys. No, no, not at all. So my understanding is that you feel still, even with the discussion, that the, the current zoning is still a better fit for your community? I think so. I think it is. Uh, you know, just um, that's my opinion. And I'll, yes. Okay, thank you. And I, I'm very sorry to hear about the horrific accident your wife went through. That's uh, terrible. And I, I hope uh, all goes well for you. Thank and, you. And um, Mr. Oh, sorry, I lost your name. I know it. I have it. You're us. Um, so after our discussion, uh, how do you feel about the proposal now? Do you still feel that um, that the proposal is still, in, you're not in favor of the proposal? Well, unfortunately, yes, but it, um, Mr. Da, I think, I don't know, is it, is it Daziak? Um, the, the gentleman who was mm -hmm. speaking uh, made me think of something else too, and I've seen this, in fact, it was in the news recently in... Um, South Edmonton around 17th Street there off of the White Mud where um, they only have one way in and one way out and there was a train and the ambulance couldn't get through. So when I was listening to this gentleman, my thinking was, well, I'm looking at that area now through the eyes of I'm going to be 70 this year and I've had a heart attack and I'm living over there and there's a car accident on the one road in and out and the ambulance can't get in. Like... I, I'd like to know more about access in and out of there because you can't have an area like that. It, I don't know if there's two roads going to be in. I mean, I think there's going to be 85th and then maybe over there. But I'm, that's another concern that I would have is the access for emergency vehicles, whether it's fire department or ambulance or anything. We can't have them being held up because of a bad snow drift or, or a car accident. So that would be another concern. It's just getting worse. But... That's where I'm thinking now. But as far as what you were asking, um, I mean, I got to thinking too about these are an apartment building and there's going to be some, maybe some commercial businesses there. So you're going to have to have a lot of parking space for vehicles, as he was saying, from coming outside the community now. So now you've got traffic of people who don't even live there. And that's just adding to it. So if you can alleviate that with, as I mentioned before, the information and letting us 
have a little more of that information so that we can make a better informed decision, that would be a big help. But at this point, I'm still leaning toward that not really thrilled with the rezoning plan. Right. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. And in my experience, from what I've seen, usually um, uh, commercial, like um, in areas like in our neighborhood, usually is just, just serviced by yeah, the neighbors, uh, like the neighborhood itself. Um, but I understand. But your that'll concern. be closer to us than 167th Avenue, where the uh, right. drugstore yeah. is. So that'll be more convenient. Convenient for you. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. There's kind of a give yeah, and take. There's yeah. Always that, yeah. There's always some. Yeah some pros. Okay, thank you. That's uh, my, the end of my questions. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Thank you. I return the chair. Thank you. Councillor Knack? Oh, no. Sorry, it didn't kick me off. Oh. Good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so that is, um, we are done with our speakers. Now, uh, questions to administration. Councillor Stevenson. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so my reading of the statistics is that the, the overall density is, is actually increasing uh, with these changes. If we look at the neighborhood statistics, very m minorly. Councillor Stevenson, yes, that is correct. I mean, I, I've looked at them as well. It's, it, it increases marginally to about 23.8 units. Yeah. No, and I, I mean, I think that's positive. I always want to be sure that we're, we're uh, maintaining and uh, not reducing. I did notice that there wasn't the, the um, uh, units per net residential hectare calculations. Is it just an older plan where we don't have those figures? That, that is correct. I mean, I, I did go back and look at it, and again, it's just okay. under 24. That's good for our brain. Excuse me, Corey Latourney, if you could mute yourself, please. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Stevenson, it's it's just under 24 units a hectare. And to put that in comparison, the surrounding neighbourhoods, uh, Shonsim, Sybeka, they're all up around 33 to 35 units per hectare. So this is considerably less dense being an older neighbourhood that was approved in 1982. Um, it's quite typical. So that's probably part of the reason for that. Right. Um... Yes, sir. Maybe I'll, I'll, yeah, just in terms of, um, and apologies, I apologize if I, I missed this, just in terms of um, how that aligns with the regional um, density standards and minimums, uh, is it because it's an existing plan we aren't obliged to meet those? That's correct. They, they more or less get grandfathered in. Um, <coughs> to, that's the way the regional board looks at it today. Okay. Um, I was I was interested though, just in terms of the plan amendment, uh, and I know this is a very minor point, but just around um, the connectivity arrows. Um, so there's one sort of the north south connectivity arrow, arrow that's that's deleted as part of this, and then the east west as well. Um, just wondering wondering the rationale, uh, particularly with the connection to the higher density residential, and and just having that connection to the uh, public utility and parks area. Uh, they, it's probably a bit of an oversight, and again, given you've, you're doing, you're modifying an older plan, um, it more or less completes this plan. Um, I think that kind of level of detail is, is just missed off the what we do when we go back and amend it at this point. Okay, would there would there be some sort of assurances that there would be some um, easy connectivity for active modes from that high density residential to the the park space? Absolutely, and I think that's something that we, we take back to the, uh, the subdivision approval group and we ask them to, uh, they're probably listening in today and they'll, they'll be aware of that because um, that's the next stage that they will go ahead and approve the, uh, any proposed subdivisions and look for those kind of linkages. Perfect. Okay, that's great to hear. That was, that was the only uh, question I had. Thank you so much. Thank you, you Councillor Stevenson. Uh, Councillor Wright? Thank you very much. I just um, wanted to uh, look at the, the concerns about the lack of marked crosswalks that uh, Mr. Babia had, had mentioned. And I noticed in the report that it does say that the owner will be required to install the marked crosswalks and pedestrian crossing signs. Is there any timeline or any requirement as to at what point um, this would be done? 
Councillor Wright, uh, Fassel Said here. Um, yes, um, uh, that will be the condition of the subdivision approval. Okay, and then so once that approval is provided. Yes, uh, so uh, the applicant will be required to make those um, uh, improvements um, uh, in order to get their subdivision registered. Okay, and then the um, the thresholds um, for the um, for widening the roadway there as well. What sorry? I guess how close are we to that threshold? That it, that it would I guess have to be done at development time or at construction of the of the, the buildings. Yes, uh, so there is a bit of a network uh, uh, that uh, remains to be constructed. Uh, if I can ask uh, the clerks to bring uh, slide 10 uh, for transportation network. So the applicant will be required to complete the looping collector uh, between uh, 85th Street and 89th Street to complete that loop in order to serve these lands. And uh, that also will accommodate active modes connectivity east-west in addition to the crosswalks that we uh, just mentioned. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. That's all I had. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Knack? No, it's okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So maybe maybe why I've confused myself on this is because um, I think about the, the previous, the last update to the statistics in that table is 2010, and our calculations for density at that time was not necessarily the same calculations we have here. So I, I may, maybe why I confuse myself, and you can tell me whether I'm wrong or right here, is ignore what's currently in the NSP because we, we, you know, if you were building out today, you might have a different density number. If you were looking at the two parcels of land and just the two parcels of land, the changes that are being proposed feel like it's a net, there's, there's a net less amount in what's being proposed versus what's there, even though overall there's a net increase to the density because we have updated our calculations over the years. Correct. So if you look at that, uh, if you're referring to that medium density parcel, yes, the RA7 or the R8 parcel, uh, what is proposed today would actually result in a net decrease of uh, 30 residents um, compared to what is allowed today under the, the RA7 and that larger site size of the RA7. Um, as you mentioned, uh, the way we calculate uh, our densities and our stats has changed in the last 14 years, typically based off of uh, the number of people per household, et cetera, which is why when we convert uh, some of that RA7 land into low density residential, uh, that bumps up the overall density because there's a, there's a net increase there. So net increase overall, but in fact, of the two things that we are comparing today, what is, it, what is before us today, we're actually, you would have, a, so if we were using the old design and updating the numbers, we might be, instead of 50.9, we might be 51 or 51.1 .1 as an example. Is that, is that correct? If I'm doing some, you know, I don't know what the actual math would be, but it could be slightly above what that currently is or what the proposal uh, is. It, it's possible that we didn't do the analysis on the old numbers. What sure. is uh, available is that, that uh, medium density parcel results in a less the, amount of people in that area. And in terms of the, the conversation related to commercial uses, again, you could have commercial uses in, in some RA7 uh, as well as RA8. So it's, there's not necessarily a, a huge potential for a net increase in commercial. It's, you could have that in the other design. It's the exact same opportunity. It's the actually. exact same opportunity. So the, that, and again, not, not to diminish the traffic concerns, which are very valid, and I'm sure the ward councillor will be we're continuing to work on that. But, but in terms of comparing apples to apples, we're not. There's no net change to that. So, um, so if there's issues, that has to be worked out in a separate piece. Okay, I think then I am fully clear on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Uh, councillor Paquette, are you okay to take the chair? Sure. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so, as uh, Councillor Nack was uh, talking about the density, I know that I see here 50.7 persons per hectare. That's for the current zoning, is that correct? If but, I, yes, that's correct. Yes. Okay, thank you. And then the proposed the density is 50.9 hectares per people. That's, that's per correct. Hectares. Yes. Okay. Based and, on the table. 
And what is uh, the city currently, what is our ideal uh, density that in the city plan? Council, that's a, that's a difficult one to answer. Um, we can answer more in terms of units uh, per hectare, which is what we've been using more because that's what we use when we go to the regional guidelines and we, we have to conform to them. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, those are about 10 units per uh, hectare higher than what we have in this neighborhood. We're typically about 35 units and above, and here we're only at about 24 units per hectare in the entire neighborhood. Uh, and I would imagine the uh, corresponding um, population density increase would go along with that in a, in a greenfield site or in newly developing areas. Okay, I, I, that confuses me a little bit because I thought we did have a number we Florida. likely do. I, we just don't have it um, here with us today. And when we I look see. at these greenfield areas, we're dealing more in units per hectare. Okay, okay. And uh, because I, I do know that Clairvatin also has a surplus school site that is uh, uh, being planned for development as well, which will also increase the density of the neighborhood. So that is also concerning to me uh, when we discuss, although I don't see today's... Um, re zoning application, rezoning application would really be that impactful of that, but that is something that we do need to consider and we do have to have those numbers. Councillor, uh, just to add uh, to Mr. Ford's answer there, uh, so the city plan outlines uh, density minimums for nodes and corridors. It doesn't go about uh, uh, aligning or sorry it doesn't go about uh, indicating uh, what the neighborhood density should be other than referring to the EMRB uh, which is uh, for new plans which is 45 dwellings per hectare uh, in new areas um, and as Mr. Ford indicated right now we're sitting at about 25 dwellings per hectare in this neighborhood uh, so well below that threshold but that's because this neighborhood was planned uh, many years ago. Uh, so there's still some room to match sort of our new neighborhood densities uh, within that um, and quite some room actually almost close, uh, not necessarily double, but close to double. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Paquette, I'll take the chair back. I return the chair. Thank you. Councillor Tang. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was wondering if administration can expand on the issue of access in and out of the neighborhood. Um, and I think I was looking at your the slide 10 for the transportation, and I was wondering if you can just elaborate a little bit more. Um, and would, you know, you know if, if rezoned, you know, would a development like this, um, would it compound, you know, that access issue, or would it facilitate? Sure. Uh, if we can have the slide back, yeah, thank you. Uh, so in terms of, um, um, Looking at the impact of this particular development, uh, we did uh, uh, complete, uh, or the applicant did uh, provided us with uh, with a transportation assessment that looked at uh, what uh, uh, assumptions were made at the NSP level and what is changing today. I even though the change is uh, minimal, uh, but uh, given that the original NSP was approved a while back and, and the TIA that was done previously was uh, 2005, a fresh look has been uh, done in order to, to just verify uh, the findings. Um, in terms of uh, uh, supporting this additional development, there are no concerns. Uh, uh, as I said, um, uh, developer will be required to complete the collector connection as envisioned uh, as part of the NSP. Uh, there will be some additional improvements to uh, um, uh, address some of the safety concerns. Um, as you can see, uh, some improvements have already been made in terms of installation of signals uh, that uh, was done as part of other development that got approved uh, in this area. Um, and uh, the issue regarding shortcutting came up as well. So just to uh, take, zoom out a bit and look at uh, the network that is serving Crystallina Nira to the east and Chauncey area. The green lines uh, that are shown to, uh, next to 66th Street are the additional connections uh, that, uh, that are again going to be uh, constructed as part of the development. Uh, so eventually once uh, those uh, missing pieces are in place, uh, there will be uh, enough uh, uh, connectivity um, uh, to the neighborhood that, that, uh, 
that was as planned and uh, we'll have no issues in that regard. Okay, great. No, thank you for that, for that clarification. Um, and I was also wondering around um, the, the, some of the concerns around the commercial, uh, you know, traffic due to commercial and I can appreciate that, you know, the, the zoning doesn't limit, um, you know, commercial development as part of that. But uh, just looking at the map, um, I'm wondering where are some of the surrounding commercial hubs? Uh, you know, how far is it in that area? You know, is it, is it ripe with amenities, you know, commercial amenities? The commercial areas are along uh, 167 oh. uh, Avenue. Uh, that's uh, one of uh, the, uh, the major corridor. Okay. Uh, I'll ask uh, uh, Mr. Ford or uh, other team members to yeah. chime in. Yes, that's that's correct. Uh, one, one, along 167th Avenue, as you get to 97th Street, and again, as you go further east into the into the Clearview areas, there's some local uh, shopping requirements on 82nd and 162nd. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, 167th Avenue as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I think finally, I was just um, so it sounds like it, you know, with it was some pretty horrific accident has happened with the existing design. Um, and within with the existing um, neighborhoods, you know, prior to any of the rezoning, um, you know, I understand we're here for the conversation about the rezoning itself. But um, do we have any sense of any kind of provisions that happened um, for traffic safety issues that the neighborhood is experiencing? For sure. Uh, so as part of our public consultation, we heard that concern quite a lot. Yeah. And we reached out to our uh, traffic uh, uh, safety section and uh, they will be conducting a safety review for um, uh, 80, 180 Avenue uh, corridor uh, yeah. from 82 Street to 91 Street. Uh, there has been some improvements also that has occurred in the past uh, next to the school sites in terms of traffic safety. And uh, there is that uh, a curb extension program uh, through which uh, uh, some improvements were also made at the intersection of 91 Street and uh, um, 180 Avenue um, uh, that was uh, mentioned in, uh, in one of the presentations. Right. Yeah. No, thank you. I, f I think, uh, well, my time is out, but I appreciate, you know, some of that reassurance that hopefully is offering. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Salvador. Uh, thank you, Mary Sohi. Uh, so just a, a question. I'm just trying to think of this in the context of zoning bylaw renewal as well. I'm, and with the loss of RA7 down to RLD, um, I'm trying to understand what the equivalencies would be there. Uh, I, I think that we'd be, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but would we be missing out on sort of that transition to um, uh, RM, I think it is? with RA7, which allows for, for mixed use? Uh, Councilor Salvador, I understand your question. Is there a potential you're talking about for somewhere, a zone or a, a density somewhere in between the two now as we're losing out on some of the, um, the RA7 kind of density in here? Is that? Uh, well, I guess, Am I, am I correct in assuming that there would be sort of that, that loss um, as we go through the zoning bylaw renewal process and RA7 becomes uh, potentially RM, that by going down to, to RLD, I don't know the equivalent for RLD um, off the top of my head, but, but there, would no, there wouldn't be mixed use included in that, correct? I'm not familiar with that. Maybe Ms. Petron can, or somebody else on staff can answer that. Councillor. Oh. Sorry, Mr. Pollock. Uh, Councillor Salvador, uh, the, the um, RA8 equivalent will have some opportunities for commercial, and the other piece that we're looking at is on the small-scale residential zone um, that would allow for some adjacent commercial adjacent to other commercial, um, in addition to a sort of an expanded home-based business opportunity in the small-scale residential zone. Okay, so the, uh, the RLD equivalent would be small-scale residential, and then there would be kind of limited opportunities for home-based businesses? That's correct. Okay, okay um, thank you so much for that clarity. I appreciate it. Thank you, Consul Salvador. So that concludes questions to administration. Any questions uh, to members of the public out of uh, new information arising out of the discussion? 
council members? Seeing none, anyone prepared to move the uh, closing of the public hearing on this by law? Oh, sure, I'll move closure of the public hearing on items 3.2 and 3.21. Second, Second 3.20 and 3.21. Second by Councillor uh, Cardinal. Good. Thank you. Please vote on the closing of the bylaw on this uh, public hearing on this bylaw. We're, we have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move uh, first reading of items 3.20 and 3.21. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Second by Councillor Second. Cartmel. Thank you. And I'll stop here. Anyone to speak? Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I'll just be really quick. I'm actually not going to support this, um, this bylaw but I'm actually not gonna support it because of the decrease in, in units. And we have talked so many times here about the cost of sprawl and the cost of building out and out and out and not, and we're seeing that in the budget we're having. So this is to me an example of how we should be holding the line. Even 30, a decrease in 30 to me is a decrease that's not even really necessary. So for those reasons, I will not be supporting this bylaw. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, Councillor Prince-Bay. Um, I, even though I, I um, see the value in this rezoning, and I think it would be actually, in my opinion, better for the community, that's not what I'm hearing from the residents. And I heard too many in opposition, but as Councillor Rutherford said, I do see the potential that there could be actually more densification in the future, that is a possibility. And that's what I was trying to, um, uh, you know, get through and explain. Uh, but I, I will um, follow the voice of the residents and I, I will not be supporting this. Thank you, Councillor Principe. Councillor Paquette. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm very sympathetic to uh, the concern of the speakers today. Uh, I do relate actually quite intimately. However, uh, I will be supporting this motion. Um, I am definitely the feeling uh, that uh, Council Rutherford is, is correct that uh, the density levels are, are probably far too low. And that is actually um, a real concern. I'm supporting this because uh, I actually don't see a material change in, in uh, the density of the community here. Um, it should be up, and frankly, it should be up simply because one of the main things we hear from residents is they want a more affordable city. If we do not increase density in our neighborhoods, we will not see that affordable city. In fact, it will go the opposite way. Um, new neighborhoods have much higher density and function well. Uh, there's no reason why uh, older neighborhoods with half the density can't uh, accommodate a little bit more in order to ensure that their taxes uh, don't increase um, exponentially, as I'm sure Councillor Cartmel would agree. So uh, with that, Mr. Mayor, um, I am ready to vote. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Paquette. Councillor Salvador. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And yeah, I just wanted to, to take a minute to um, to speak to this, uh, as I will not be supporting the the rezoning for for a few reasons. Similar to Councillor Rutherford, um, I think that quite recently we received an update on our capital and operating budgets, and um, it, it, we we really need to have a critical conversation about how to how to start shifting that dial, recognizing that. At this point, decades of um, sort of low density outward expansion has gotten us into a really challenging financial uh, position. So uh, that that's big for me, and I think that as we're looking towards zoning bylaw renewal as well, um, recognizing that we're we're going to be losing some of those opportunities for mixed use development uh, with the um, the RA seven equivalent going down to to RLD, which would be small scale residential. Yes, there could be opportunities for um, home based businesses, but I think we really need to um, yeah move a little bit 
firmer towards that true mixed use uh, potential that I think we need to see if we want to have those walkable 15 minute communities across the entire city. Uh, so for those reasons, I will not be supporting this. Thank you so much. I appreciate the conversation today. Thank you, Councilor Salvador. Councilor Jans. I'd like to echo everything Councilor Salvador and Councilor Rutherford said, and I too will not be supporting this. Thank you, Councilor Jans. Councilor Nack to close. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, appreciate all the discussion on this, and, and just I wanted to offer my thanks to the to Councilor Principe uh, when, after the election, one of the first things we did was we went for a little drive, and she took me into to the neighborhood to show what was going on in your in your community. So, uh, it was a pleasure to get to do that, and so uh, you know I felt like I had sm a small taste of, of what you were been working on. So, uh, just my my first comment is you've got a councillor who who had a really good understanding within I think a few weeks we went out for a drive, and she already had a really good sense of what you were all working on. So. Um, so this is interesting because again, the total net change as we've talked about is, is very minor. Uh, and so I can understand why some of my colleagues wouldn't support it because it technically is a decrease. Um, it's a small enough decrease that, that I don't really think it's going to change in any meaningful way the concerns that were raised today. I think there's a, ser a separate series of concerns related to traffic safety, related to other pieces that need to be worked on outside of this process here today, and I know your counselor is someone who, who is well aware of that and, and will work on that with you. Um, I'll, I'll support this because, again, truly it's, it's really insignificant in terms of the change, but I did hear that, you know, the community was concerned about density increases, and, and this actually will, in a very small way, uh, make it slightly better. So, uh, again, recognizing that this was probably not the right venue to solve all of the other problems we have to deal with, but I think, uh, I, I, I think I'll support this because it's, it's, it's still a reasonable change, even though it is technically a small overall net decrease compared to what could be there. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Please vote on the first reading. Is, is this consideration or voting on the reading? Um, voting on first reading, Councillor Jans. Thank you. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I'll move second reading of the same two items, 3.20, 3.21. Second. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Councilor Tang second this fine. Okay. Uh, please vote. Second reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I'll move consideration of third reading on items 3.20 and 3.21. Second, Second by Councilor Cartmel. Please uh, vote for consideration. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And I'll move third and final reading of bylaw 20058 and charter bylaw 20059. Second. Second by Councillor Cartmel. Please vote for the final reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. All right. So now, we are going to 3.23. Right, I'll check if people are here before I go there. Uh, Marcelo Figuera, are you there, Marcelo? Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I'm here. Good. And Dinesh uh, Deshpande? Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm right here, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And uh, Gurmeet Sandhu? Gurmeet, are you there? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'm here. Thank you. And people in opposition, uh, Randy Muhort. Randy, are you there? Yes, I am here. And Warren Champion. Warren. Yes, I'm. Here? I'm here. Thank you. And Michael Brown. Michael. Michael is working out of town, and is tied up during the day. No worries. So he did provide a letter. But he, he won't be here for this. No worries. Paul Grewal? 
Yes, I am. And Ron Sadaway. Hello. Ron, are you there? And Richard Diep. No, I'm here. Thank you. And this was exempted by Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Stevenson, you need a presentation? Uh, no, with, I, with the number of people interested, I think it will benefit to have a presentation. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Administration, go ahead, please. Good afternoon. This application is to rezone a parcel in the central McDougal neighborhood from the RF1 single detached residential zone to the RA7 low rise apartment zone. The proposed RA7 would allow for an approximately four story residential building with limited commercial opportunities at ground level. An amendment to the central McDougal area redevelopment plan is also necessary to facilitate the rezoning. Next slide, please. The site is located on 108th Street towards the end of the block and closer to 110th Avenue. It is a good location for increased density as it is within walking distance of the Kingsway Transit Centre, three schools and regional shopping and institutions. The building height and form permitted by the RA7 is compatible with the overall mix of built forms in the immediate area. Next slide please. The images on the slide show the maximum potential massing of a building under the existing RF1 zone and the proposed RA7 zone. When comparing the two, key differences between the zones are an increase in height and density. You can see from the RA7 model the potential size of the four-story building impacts both neighboring properties, but is similar in scale to many nearby buildings. Next slide, please. Administration sought community feedback through advance notices and engaged Edmonton webpage and by attending a community-led meeting to discuss the application. We heard from community members that they would like to see the ARP honored and protect the zoning in place for single detached housing and that the scale and commercial uses of the RA7 zone were inappropriate for the site. Administration hears the community's concerns and we recognize that changes in zoning result in impacts on the ground and in the community, particularly when it comes to the building size. To help improve the transition between medium and small scale buildings, the RA7 was recently amended to increase the interior side setback for buildings taller than 10 meters. Next slide, please. This site is influenced by multiple city plan intensification areas. It is located within the 111th Avenue Primary Corridor and sits between the Centre City and the Kingsway Major Node. Primary corridors are intended as prominent urban streets that provide critical connections throughout the city. They seek to increase density and this is achieved through mid and high rise buildings. Being within the primary corridor, this proposal meets the density goals of city plan for this area. The constraints of this smaller site make a mid rise building unrealistic and while the low rise building allowed by RA7 is a smaller built form than expected, it responds to the site context. Adopted in 1998, the Central McDougal Queen Mary Park ARP aims to keep a variety of housing types in the neighborhood and this includes protecting the RF1 zoning for single family housing. To facilitate this application, the ARP would be amended to label this site as low rise apartments instead of single family housing. Next slide, please. Administration supports this application. It will, it will provide more people with access to transit service and to community and commercial amenities. The proposed zone includes regulations to ensure the built form is compatible with the surrounding buildings. Administration recognizes that this change will impact abutting properties and the community in general. However, those impacts are the trade-offs of a proposal that helps to achieve the goals and aligns with the policies of the city plan. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll uh, call up on uh, Marcelo Figueroa to uh, make a presentation first. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you. I think uh, um, the order we, we refer, so Yonish uh, will do the first uh, four slides and then I'll pick up on the fifth slide. Okay, Thank you. Uh, Mr. Deshpande, you go first. 
You're muted. Go ahead now. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, members of council. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to uh, present our application. Again, my name is Dhyanesh Deshpande. I'm principal uh, with Green Space Alliance. And in my presentation, I'm basically just going to build on uh, the presentation uh, made by administration and stress or highlight key aspects of the context and the policy framework that uh, supports our application. So next slide, please. Uh, as you can see uh, in the city plan, uh, like this site is located within 100, 111th Avenue primary corridor. And as administration mentioned, within uh, the primary corridors, mid rise or high rise buildings are envisioned, you know, like for future transformation. So the RA7 building type that we have identified clearly aligns with the city plan objectives. Next slide, please. Uh, this particular slide provides some additional context. You can see here uh, the site is located on 108th Street, just south of 111th Avenue, primary corridor identified in the city plan and the district planning framework. In general, uh, the 111th Avenue primary corridor area of influence is within one block. So uh, you can see that the site is within one block south of 111th Avenue. Uh, it's also in very close proximity to four school sites. Uh, it is walking distance from uh, Kingsway Royal Alex LRT station, walking distance from uh, Kingsway Mall, Royal Alex hospitals. And in addition to that, variety of uh, parks and open spaces are very close by. I would also like to stress the fact that uh, very recently, Central McDougal and Queen Mary Park uh, neighborhoods uh, were part of neighborhood renewals, and the city has invested millions of dollars in terms of new sidewalks and improved parks and open spaces. Especially when the city does those sorts of like investments, it is good to see that the private sector is responding by investing in private properties. I was personally involved in the development of urban design framework for those uh, two neighborhoods. Uh, so, uh, we really feel that uh, now uh, this particular landowner, our client, investing uh, and developing a RA7 type complements uh, those broader city objectives. On the left hand side, you can see the site's immediate context. Right now, uh, there are single family build forms within the block, but there are also other uh, multifamily uh, units uh, that are in the immediate surrounding context. So, next slide, please. Uh, as you as you can see here uh, on the top uh, left hand uh, corner of the uh, slide, uh, the site is within 400 meters from uh, the Kingsway Royal Alex LRT station. So really, again, a good uh, site for uh, uh, transit oriented development. Uh, but uh, the image uh, at the bottom left hand corner, uh, you can see uh, the broader context of this site. The site is located mid block on the west side of 108th Street. Uh, but in that block itself, on the north side and the south side, even on the east side of 108th Street and along uh, 109 Avenue corridor, you can see multiple uh, three-story like walk-up apartments, which are also zoned RA7. So when you look at the broader context, uh, in terms of massing and build form, this particular uh, uh, product that we are proposing really fits uh, with the surrounding context. There are multiple uh, city plan targets and policies uh, that support uh, our application. I would like to just highlight policy 2.2.1.6, which, which calls for uh, enabling residential infill to occur at variety of scales, densities, and designs uh, within the residential area of the city plan. When it comes to the design, we strongly feel that uh, the new uh, RA7 uh, uh, setbacks that the city had recently approved uh, we, the product that we are uh, proposing really enables that transition from single family development uh, to RA7 uh, type densities. And Marcelo will be definitely elaborating various design options that are available to successfully implement that uh, new RA7 building typology. So at this point, I'm going to uh, stop my presentation, but I'm always uh, available to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you very much for the opportunity and we're looking forward to your support. Thank you so much, Mr. Deshpande. Next, I'll go to Mr. Fugira. 
Oh, you're mute, Marcelo. Sorry about that. So good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Council, and thank you for the opportunity to present today. My goal with this presentation is to show that although the R7 zone is called low-rise apartment, in reality, it can accommodate different multi-unit housing options. But first, I'd like to outline our engagement efforts as they relate to the design options that I will show in this presentation. So at the beginning of the project, we had several conversations with the planning director of the Central McDougal Community League about this application. We'd like to acknowledge that without his help to organize a Zoom meeting with the community, it would, be, would have been very challenging to engage with the residents. And also, we want to thank the planning department for attending that meeting to observe the discussions. And although the application is for a conventional zone, we created four massing models to demonstrate the potential of the I-7 zone. This helped to, the, to convey to the community some development features such, such as setbacks, height, location and access to parking areas, waste collection areas, and ground-oriented units. To create these design options, we took cues from the existing precedents in the city and discussed their market feasibility with other developers. We also estimated the number of units that could be built based on market averages. So the two first options in the next slides were created for the community to visualize an apartment building because that was one of uh, their main concerns of uh, being built on a single lot. Next slide, please. So the first option is a walk-up apartment with no parking for residents. Only a couple of parking spaces are provided in the rear for visitors. The maximum height is 10 meters to keep the size set back at 1.5 meters. Since the abutting developments to the north and south are single detached houses, to maximize the height would mean that the size set back would have to increase to 10 meters uh, above that uh, the 10 uh, meter marker height. This would significantly uh, impact the, the feasibility of this development. So in this, in this situation, we would keep the height at 10 meters and not utilize the full FAR. Next slide, please. In the second option, the building is similar to the one uh, shown in the previous slide. However, the basement area is used for limited residential parking space, thus reducing the number of units. The, the basement would accommodate a limited number of parking space on no level of underground parking to address a potential demand for future residents and the community concerns regarding on-street parking. The size setbacks are still 1.5 meters and the building height is still three stories. Again, the maximum FAR is not achieved. Next slide, please. So in the third and fourth options, this is really the, the build form that we are uh, encourage the owners to pursue. We use the stack row housing as alternative building forms. The side setbacks are increased to three meters to allow for additional height. However, because there are no common areas such as hallways and stairwells found in walk-up apartment buildings, this option provides more square footage for the, for the units. This option also provides more ground-oriented units fronting uh, the, the side lot lines and more build articulation to achieve the additional height allowed in the zone. And the FAR is very close to the maximum allowed. Next slide, please. In the fourth option, we added a rooftop amenity area to the stack row house show on the previous slide. The amenity area is a, it's further away from the side lot lines for privacy. Both FAR and height are very close to the maximum allowed in the zone, making this option very attractive to developers. In both options, three and four, all units would have three bedrooms, make it very attractive to future residents while addressing the community concern of potential loss of housing for families, as those would be three bedrooms. This option reduced the building massing to provide a better interface to adjacent single-detach houses and allow for increased landscape areas. Next slide, please. So to uh, conclude my presentation, I would say that uh, with the recent amendments to the RA7, this zone has become a good fit to implement the intensification goals of the city plan in large and small sites. Its regulations for the interface with abutting single detached houses address council's concern in past applications regarding the coexistence of a range of building forms as the city plan is implemented. So we hope we will support this application. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next is Mr. Gurmeet Sandhu. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and respected council. My name is Gurmeet Sandhu. I am a realtor with Remax for 17 years, and I'm here to support this application for rezoning. Based on our understanding of this area, there is a demand for multi-unit housing in this area. 
because of its proximity to schools, LRT station, Kingsway Mall, and other destinations. When the site is located close to LRT, schools, parks, and shopping, we generally see young couples, seniors, young families, immigrant families tend to move in such developments as they prefer to be close to amenities and need not worry about maintenance and other costs that come with owning a house. In my opinion, from market perspective, if you maximize the buildable area, this site can make a feasible development. The RA7 development on this site allows the alternate native built from off people in a particular stage in life. I would like to request council to support this application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sandhu, for your presentation. And uh, I will go to council members for questions. Just, just for a second here. Council members, questions? Seeing none, thank you so much for your presentation. Now we will go to uh, community, community, community members in opposition. And I'll start with uh, Randy Muhort. Ms. Randy Muhart, you're first. Yes, thank you. Um, I really appreciate the chance to speak in front of council again. Um, I'd like to start by saying thank you very much for having a remote option. It's quite lovely. Uh, I'm in opposition. Uh, I own the house not right next door to this development, but to the north of the, I call it my sister house because we were, it's uh, two skinnies on one lot. Um, I really do feel that this the RA7 is going to cut into a block of RA1 zone and that it looks quite odd to have suddenly this very tall structure in the middle of these houses. It's going to impact my quality of life because it's going to be shading me. I appreciate council's concerns for density and I know that is the way the city is going. However, this neighborhood is already very dense and I think these type of developments are better on the margins of the blocks, and this is not. Um, I would also like to point out that I appreciate that it is nice to move to a smaller, um, less yard intensive um, unit. However, I think that the favored options would involve a lot of stairs, and I don't think that's going to appeal to a lot of older people. I think it would also be problematic for people with young families as you know, if you're having to run up and down the stairs with children all the time on three or four floors, I think that's problematic. I'd like to point out as well that the current zoning does allow for six units on what is now a single family site. And that would be um, an in a considerable increase in density as it is without changing the zoning. I think that's the gist of my arguments. Um, there's already parking controls uh, in the neighborhood and it's a frustration to me that when I have visitors, they can only stay two hours. So I can see that that's going to be a problem for anybody moving into the neighborhood as well, especially if there's no parking um, provided to the building. And not that I know traffic doesn't count as much as it used to, but I would point out that the alley entrance um, to, the, to the units and to my house is already very, very busy and is limited in the directions you can travel. So there's, there's several issues there. I think that sums everything up for me. Thank you. And thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you so much for your presentation. Next, I will go to uh, Mr. Warren Champion. Mr. Champion? He was there earlier on. Warren, are you there? Yeah, I'm there here. There we go. Go ahead. Thanks, guys. Uh, I got a lot to cover, so I'm going to get onto it. First of all, this is a generic zoning. We have no idea what is actually going to go there as long as it conforms to zoning. That's it. So at the end of the day, you know, what you're hearing may or may not occur. And I want to 
make everybody on council aware that we're never opposed to substantial increases in density. I and an architect actually back in the early, almost in 2000, brought the whole North Edge to the city of Edmonton, intending to bring Vancouver Light to there, brought Columbia Avenue. We supported a great deal of density there. And what they're doing is more or less what David and I suggested. I also suggested to the city that we expand Precinct C all the way to 108. They're going to put about just an existing zoning, probably about 4,000, 4,100 people, an FAR of 10. So at the end of the day, we do support a lot of density. Going north between 6th and 4th, or 6th and 8th uh, Avenue, we have six-story density, and we'd actually be willing, at least on part of it, to look at a higher density. So we're aiming to probably put in a community of 5,000 people, about 11,000 people. What we are also cognizant of at that time was that we actually had to have a community that had a broader plan, not one-offs here or there. And so we took the entire community into consideration, and we realized that if we're going to have an inclusive community, we actually have to have children there. We have to have young families there. So the area north of 108th Avenue was to remain some form of single family dwelling, not necessarily uh, in its present context. And at the end of the day, we're willing to support 600% change in that area. Having said that, you know, it is really aggravating to, it's almost a slap in the face that you're going to put this type of development with no controls, no nada into this community when the really big problem is that we have somewhere around 88% multiple unit rentals. And we have immigrant families who are living there in 650 square foot places with a couple of kids and they're just waiting to get the heck out of the community, save some money and get out because there's no place to have a family. You know, that's actually really ridiculous, frankly. And 85% of this community moves within five years. And I guarantee, I have never found another community in North America that actually has that type of transience. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna put some more rentals and we have no idea what those rentals are gonna be. We have seen provisions for no parking whatsoever uh, outside of the waste uh, garbage disposal. So at the end of the day, we don't know what we would be getting anyway. And we have a big parking problem because we have people parking from the Royal Alex, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all over the community. And now we could have, oh, I don't know, 20, 25 cars out front. So at the end of the day, none of this makes sense. And the irony of this is after waiting for a lengthy period of time, and you're going to hear about it, we have a couple of good developers, one that lives in the community that is perfectly willing to build skinny houses or side-by-side -side duplexes, exactly what we want and what we should have there. So, you know, it is very aggravating to finally get to the point where we're going to see some changes and this is the type of change that is being brought to us. And I'm saying, you know, when we talk about infill, we're talking about providing <clears throat> mixed forms of housing. We are swimming in the middle uh, sort of middle mass or middle uh, community. We have walk-ups and row houses everywhere. We just don't happen to have almost anything for family housing. So that's a real problem. And I know I'm gonna run out of time sometime. So I wanna direct you to enclosure three of what I sent. It's called a technical review. And I don't have a bunch of time and you guys might wanna ask me, but drainage and EPCOR are saying they're not gonna support anything more than single family or duplex zoning on that site. And they made all sorts of provisions, but I will read the last sentence. This may require the applicant to construct approximately 70 meters of new water main, 25 meters of new hydrant uh, lead, and one new hydrant. And on top of it, the actual drainage isn't working. So we figure it'll be about $600,000 to do that and he paid 310,000 for the lot. So if you wanna ask me some actual questions so we can get to the bottom of it, I'd be happy to answer that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tempion. Next, we will go to uh, Mr. Paul, Paul Grewal. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, and uh, good afternoon, councillors. My name is Paul Grable, and I'm a custom home builder and a land developer. I have participated in public hearing regarding this proposed rezoning application. And during the hearings, I raised my concern about lack of storm and sewer capacity for this development because I had seen the potential for fl uh, flooding, especially related to the 108 Street from the city's flood mitigation website maps. That website clearly showed that even a moderate downpour can cause localized flooding of basements. During the city's presentations on these public hearings, I was given the impression by the city's representative that additional excessive capacity was recently installed. Now I see EPCOR's latest assessment absolutely demolishing and discarding that assurance. There is not enough capacity for EPCOR water and hydrant fire, fire uh, suppression. Two homes on the corner of 109, and one, uh, 109 Avenue and 108 Street flooded not too long ago. There are no plans to install any storm services in the back alley and all discharges into the main sewer service without any additional capacity. I don't think you need to be a rocket scientist to figure out the end results Absolutely no parking stalls are proposed on uh, or planned on the property, but the potential of 24 units will literally fill half of the block on one side of the main street, even if only half of the residents had a single vehicle. Now I have additional concerns. The city planning has a piecemeal development plan in place without any, consist any consistency where no one knows what's gonna pop up right next door to, a new, uh, you know, to their new purchase. This uncertainty is very negative to potential developers, builders, investors, and above all, to any potential buyers. My company owns at least four properties in this community and planning to acquire additional six more by the year's end. That is the equivalent of the city's block between two avenues. As a builder who had already built a set of new infill single family detached homes and the community league being very supportive and happy with those builds, now I find myself at crossroads with the new, uh, new purchases. Why? Because I have no idea if my potential buyers who have contacted my company in the last two months who are professors at the nearby universities or Nate or, or a doctor at the Royal Alex will still be willing to spend close to three quarters of a million dollars on a custom home with fear, with a fear in their mind that a huge towering multifamily unit could be popping next door. Well, that's exactly that's what's, uh, what's gonna happen with this rezoning application. There are a couple of proponents being represented today for this area, our so-called developers who are first and foremost realtors with at least one of them absolutely no proven track record of any building or development. That is a question we raised in the last public hearing and we were told there was no record of his development and he's the prime applicant for this one here. Their intention is to simply add value through rezoning and sell for profit and frustrate current residents living here for the last few decades to leave so eventually this neighborhood can be turned into a new concrete jungle. I have consulted with few friendly builders who showed interest in building single family detached or semi-detached homes in this neighborhood. That would give this community a huge facelift with young family professionals willing to take on ownership of high-end homes, but with an almost like a lottery style sporadic rezoning system, no one knows what's coming up next. All I see is a potential for smaller compact cube style homes, not actual homes that will attract only the very low end of the income scale. And this community is already in, inundated with that sort of population. And that's the last thing what the community wants. Now, when, when I seen the, the presentation on this one, if the, the administration's uh, slide number five could be put up on, on the screen on this one here, you can actually see there's a row of the RF1 and all of a sudden a single lot is protruding out as the RA7. That is what's being proposed for the rezoning of this one. Why can't we just simply have some consistency and the people next door who just spend close to half a million dollars to buy those new uh, infills not too long ago from Ontario Homes? I'm sure they're going to be shadowed. They're not going to be too happy with this one here with this tower in between those single family homes. And that is absolutely unacceptable to any new owners or potential uh, potential buyers and residents wanting to raise their families within this community. Now, one, one of the words here from the prime uh, consultant here was, you know, they, they don't refer to this one as a housing or people. They refer to this one as a product. This is simply a product. Now, if that goes to show you the intent or the involvement with the community and the entire community is up in arms, they're absolutely opposing it and so am I, and I'm one of those builders and, and developers who should be actually on the other side happy and see, yeah, okay, well, give me a density, I can pick up these 
cheap lots. But where are the where are the concerns for the community and the families who want, still want to be there, who have been here for decades? So with that, I will conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Grewal. Next, next, I will go to uh, Mr. Ron Sadaway, who is here present in the hall. Go ahead. Good. The red light's on. Good afternoon. As a long-standing member of this community, I am very upset with the planning departments and the city developments uh, that have disregarded our ARP, which took three years to develop. The lack of support to the community is establishing a safe and sustainable community. This haphazard approval of inappropriate developments in central McDougal is unexceptionable and demonstrates the lack of concern the city holds for communities in the core. Numerous community members have spent hours of their time trying to assist planning in development that has enhanced the community, but has fallen on deaf ears and into that hand is opportunist developers with no regard to this community. We have faced this issue for years. If there isn't a change and support for this community, the city is truly developing a community with far more social and safety issues. Understandably, we are totally against this development. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation and also being here. Next, I will go to uh, Mr. Rich Diep. Hi, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. Um, I can't really add too much um, technically to what has already been said. Um, I can really just share uh, why I moved into this neighborhood. I actually live in the house just north of the, um, the site, the uh, skinny home. So I'm Randy's twin homeowner. So uh, when we were choosing to move into a new neighborhood, we could have moved into the outskirts of the, uh, of the city. Um, but we chose the central area um, to start a family. And... Uh, Yeah, we wanted to be central, be into, into an older neighborhood that we can kind of uh, start a family and grow. Um, but we love the area. Um, and with this new proposed site, is completely opposite of what we had uh, intentionally envisioned when we had moved into the area. Um, so this completely flips everything around um, with the parking issues, um, with the safety concerns. Um, I think we would have to really assess where we're at uh, with our family um, because we are a young family. Um, but uh, adding on to what has already been said, the biggest issue I see is the parking as well. There's absolutely no uh, consideration for parking. Uh, everything will be parked on the street, um, 108th Street, and the alleyway that... Uh, connects all of the, uh, the units facing 109 and 108 will basically go through that uh, really uh, underdeveloped alleyway and um, essentially cause a lot of concern as well uh, in that area. Um, If the middle class is to move into this area, like I have, uh, have building this massive uh, complex there will essentially just push out the middle class and you'll just see, I can just see the, the area kind of deteriorating afterwards because it's, you'll get a high transiency going through that area. People will just come and leave. Uh, I don't see how that supports the the schools that are in this area as well. Um, but yeah, I, there's not a whole lot I can add to, to what has already been said, but just to give my, uh, 
just to share my story of uh, why I moved into the area. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation. We'll go to, uh, we'll check with council members if they have any questions to the panel. I think there's another speaker. There is? Uh, Michael Brown. Uh, he's away. I'll okay. check. Is he, he joined is, us? Oh, he is showing up on the screen, so maybe just double I'll check. check. Mr. Brown, are you there, Michael Brown? Here you are. Appreciate that. Sorry, All I, right. I must have missed the roll call. I was in the meeting and I, I wasn't able to. Um, yeah. So Go ahead. It. Go ahead. You have five minutes to make your presentation. Sure. Um, so uh, I just want to echo some of the important points made uh, earlier. Um, principally, uh, I don't think the infrastructure can handle this. Um, and I think that ought to uh, be a, game, uh, uh, a deal breaker, really, for a development of this, uh, this size mid block. Um, Initially, when I heard of it, I, I thought it was sort of floating a balloon. I thought it was maybe a joke, you know, that the administration was going to knock this down. Um, so I'm very surprised to see them uh, actually support this, especially given the infrastructure uh, deficits. Um, I asked, uh, had, uh, is this, um, well, first of all, I asked uh, if the developer had any experience developing. The answer was no. I asked if, um, what the plan area had for this area, it said RF1, uh, single family close to the school. I asked if it was common uh, for the city to develop uh, RA7 in between uh, two single uh, detached lots. Uh, that was very unlikely. Um, uh, in fact, I would be amazed to see something like this proposed in just about any other neighborhood uh, in the city. Um, asked about parking, they said, uh, well, we don't have to do parking, there's no parking requirements. Um, asked if they uh, were aware of the current mix of housing in the neighborhood. People have heard uh, the proponents talk about adding diversity. In fact, this takes away from the diversity within the community. There's only about, uh, well, fewer than 100 uh, single family home lots or single family homes. About 30% of them are owned by, by developers. Uh, if this sort of thing uh, is approved, uh, it throws a lot of that into jeopardy. Um, a lot of the upzonings tend to get, if there's no market for the actual product that they're proposing, uh, it just sterilizes the land. Land uh, stays empty for a very long period of time, which brings all kinds of uh, blight to the neighborhood. We've seen that with uh, a DC2 site that was approved across from the school, and the community said this was a bad idea. Um, and lo and behold, it's up for sale, it's being flipped. Um, and, uh, you know, it just goes to uh, the process of developing uh, the community. And what, what is really necessary at this point is a more stable community form. Our cur current situation is violent crime in our neighborhood is uh, five times uh, that of uh, neighborhoods like Oliver, um, which is significant. It's 400, 500% more. Um, it's quite significantly higher than the city average. It didn't used to be that way. Um, Warren will tell you that uh, in the 1970s, 1980s, prior to the city uh, upzoning all, all of the uh, residential lots to uh, RA7, uh, property values were above uh, average. Uh, crime was on average. So there's been a significant uh, negative change to the community over the last uh, decades, especially over the last recent you know, half a decade, I'd say, uh, where uh, crime doubled in our neighborhood. It's tied amongst the highest in the entire city. Uh, we need to, to do things to change that. Um, and stability in the neighborhood is going to be very important. So more uh, skinny houses, more row houses, uh, more family houses, especially around the school, especially in the area that's planned for the, for that purpose. Um, the neighborhood is not against density. We're uh, supporting a doubling of the neighborhood density. We're already a very high, highly dense neighborhood. And we provide a lot of uh, tax revenue back to the city. Um, I think we're seventh in the entire uh, city for um, for tax uh, land, land taxes. Uh, and finally, I would just say um, that um, I understand the desire for increased density, and but I think it's it's super important to to understand that not all upzonings create density. In fact, some sterilize land and lower density they and they can 
uh, lower the actual developability of a neighborhood. Um, it could push it, set us back uh, significantly um, to have a healthier skelter approach to zoning in our neighborhood. We need a consistent plan. Um, and we need um, something that um, developers who are doing positive things can get behind and can continue to, to change the narrative uh, for, for our neighborhood. I hope that you will consider that um, this neighborhood, uh, like you would your own, that you would um, understand our issues and, um, and hear us. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you so much uh, for being here, Ms. Brown. All right, so I'll go to questions from council members now. And Councilor Stevenson, you exempted this. I'll go to you first. Go ahead. Sure, thank you. Uh, thanks very much to all the speakers for taking the time to, to be here in, in person and online, which I agree is a, a great option, uh, and really appreciate you all taking the time to, to share your perspectives. I, you know, I think I think your comments, um, you know, raise a lot of uh, questions and and some of the challenges that we see in in transition in our communities. And I'll certainly be following up with administration around uh, that the question around infrastructure, and um, and just sort of where we're maybe seeing other applications like this as well. Um, but I did want to take the opportunity to to maybe speak. I did hear a few comments, uh, concerns that this type of development would lead to to greater crime. Uh, and social disorder, and I just wanted to dig into that a bit further. So, so maybe I'll go to Mr. Brown. Um, so, you, you know, you compared compared the crime levels in your neighborhood to Oliver, uh, and yet Oliver is is a significantly denser neighborhood. So, just wondering if you could uh, help me understand that correlation you were drawing. Yeah, I'm not sure that Oliver is um, that much higher density. I think Oliver, in fact, probably has a greater mix of of family uh, sort of. Uh, housing types, greater mix of uh, economic um, mix of uh, family or household, um, you know, a greater household mix, um, especially income-wise. Um, and I think that um, that's part of what, and, and especially uh, the transiency rate, if you look at the transiency rate of a neighborhood like, um, like Oliver versus Central McDougall. The, the stat that Warren gave 85% uh, moving within uh, two years uh, is, well, I think the average stay is about two and a quarter years. So what we really need is housing that people are willing to stay in longer term. And this doesn't help. Um, I, I understand that it's, uh, it's one development, but every development matters. And if you go back, um, you know, like three quarters of the neighborhood has been changed one development at a time. And it's imperative at this point that every development move us in the right direction, because if it's moving us in the wrong direction, uh, like we have a lot of a long ways to dig ourselves out of. Hello. Um, if we're going the wrong way, it's it's, uh, it's just really the city is shooting right. itself in the foot. We'll get back to you, okay? Sure. Yeah. I think. Mr. Oh. Hey, Mr. Champion, can you please mute yourself? Okay. Go ahead. Uh, the, the crime issue. I mean. Is, is multifaceted too, though. Um, so a big part of it has to do uh, with the, the transiency rates, the fact that um, neighborhood bonds aren't able to be created. Um, because, uh, for example, our community sorry, garden. Mr. Mr. Brown, I'm just, I'm just um, short on establish. time. Sorry, sorry to, to cut you off there. I think, I think for me, I'm, I'm just really struggling to, to draw that really direct correlation between the built form and some of the challenges that your neighborhood mm -hmm. is facing. And not to say that those aren't real challenges, um, mm -hmm. but but just not sure I'm following uh, how how this built form um, is right. particularly contributing to that over others. Well, I mean, smaller units basically um, don't allow for uh, a longer, like people to transition through the various uh, cycles of life, right? And so they're forced to move. And when people move more often, um, it both, gives cover for criminal activity, but also um, it, uh, it disrupts the, the social fabric, mm. allowing um, bad actors to carry on. Yeah. Uh, the lower the, the propensity sort of for like concentrated poverty uh, is, is well associated with uh, criminal activity with both as a, it creates a vulnerable pool of people that, that predators get, can play, uh, prey off of. And then we've seen that significantly
And sorry, you know, sorry, Mr. Brown, I'm going right? to stop you there. Sorry, just I just have a minute left and just wanted to ask uh, Mr. Dia really briefly. But thank you. I mean, thanks uh, for, for highlighting those concerns. Again, um, I'll, I'll just be reflecting a bit further on that and, and those correlations that you're drawing. Um, Mr. Dia, I think it was. Um, do I have have your name there, right, Richard? Yeah, Dia. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I you know I really appreciated you sharing your story and and you know why you were uh, made the choice to to move to this neighborhood, which I agree is a, a great location and and really, um, you know I think your your actions speak to I think what we're trying to achieve through City Plan, which is uh, bringing bringing more people to the core. Um, so, just just so I can understand as well, when I'm looking at at the the block, it seems like there is already a mix of apartments and houses on your block. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think on the peripheries, like on the on the corners, there are some the three story walk ups. Yeah, and in the middle there are um, uh, single detached homes. So this development will actually go in between two single detached homes as well. Okay, sorry, I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank so much. you, Councillor Stevenson, Councillor Rutherford. Yes. Yeah, so my question is also to Mr. Brown. Um, when administration did their presentation, I was actually excited to hear that these were three bedroom units because a lot of, that's a huge gap right now in non uh, single family housing to actually have more than two units. They're usually either, you know, single or bachelor even or two bedroom at most. And, and so I guess, and then you said, you mentioned something about three quarter of a million dollar home is feared that, that they're gonna net me next to a multifamily. But one of the things we're trying to sort out as the council is that missing middle, that sweet spot between those, you know, expensive skinnies, let's be honest, it doesn't matter where they are. They're not, they're not affordable to, to many families and, mm -hmm. and apartment rentals. So, do you not see that this that these three bedroom units would not would actually bring in a different um, family oriented demographic, or am I missing something? Yeah, I think there's maybe been some miscommunication. I mean, a standard RA seven zone um, it doesn't require uh, the developer to do any uh, type of uh, number of bedrooms. So they can tell you three bedrooms, they can tell you five bedroom. It doesn't. There's no, no nothing to hold anybody to to anything. In fact. Uh, that was one of my questions was, has this developer done three bedroom build buildings anywhere? And my answer, and the answer was, they haven't done any type of development anywhere. So it appears to me that that it's simply just an upzoning uh, for the sake of flipping the land. Um, the issue really is that the only economical thing to do on an RA7 lot and some, you know, is to max out the, the number of units, which is, uh, you know, the proponent actually has has um, has said that they're, they're planning it to do. And that would be, Basically, zero three bedroom units that would be all bachelor units. Um, the neighborhood is a very mixed, is a missing middle neighborhood. Like you know, ninety percent of the housing in our in our neighborhood is missing middle. What we're missing is is the larger sort of uh, you know fifteen hundred square foot family units. And we're not talking you know million dollar houses here. Although we don't have any of those in the neighborhood, it's not like uh, we have an affordability issue across the street. There's a uh, two bedroom apartments for sale for less than eighty thousand um, dollars. One a couple blocks away was recently it was on the market for uh, about ninety thousand for a year, and then the the owner t accepted fifty thousand dollars. Like affordability is not the, the, an issue that we have in our neighborhood. Uh, it's that people uh, are unwilling to live in a neighborhood where uh, social disorder is rampant, where um, you know our community garden um, had four different people uh, over three years trying to uh, make the walkways accessible because each person uh, moved within the, you know, within less than a year. How do you uh, carry on a community? How do you uh, deal with social issues and build community and, and all the rest uh, in that type of situation? And we really need the kind of development that, that um, family housing developers are bringing into our community. We don't want to stop that. If we stop that, we literally lose the opportunity of taking advantage of of what might be one of the last um, you know economic big economic booms uh, in Edmonton in, in a while. And so I think we really want to work with people who are.
building out the community in such a way that it will be sustainable, that it will be attractive, and that will attract further development. I mean, half the neighborhood, um, you know, the whole area behind McEwen and Rogers Place is basically contingent upon um, people wanting to live in our in our community. Um, if we can start to get some development that's positive and uh, change the narrative, um, all of that becomes very desirable to be built, and that completely changes, you know, the the finances for the city. Like if we're if we're doubling the the tax base in in the core neighborhoods, like that makes such a huge difference. Yeah. Okay. I just saw that Mr. Singh raised his hand. So do you have any additional comments to that in my last 45 seconds? Uh, yes, just wanted to kind of clarify this one. I was the one who made the comment regarding the three quarter of a million dollars. Uh, the, the reason being here, I had recent inquiries. There's actually a physician here from Rawl Alex that owns a property over here uh, in, in the community, but he doesn't live here. But recently we got inquiries here as a builder uh, from a couple of uh, physician couples that moved in from Ottawa. And they're working there. They're looking for these properties out here. I mean, that'll, that'll be an ideal sort of situation on this one here. Yes. Are we going to produce every single one of these ones extremely high end, which is not going to be uh, sort of affordable? No, that's not the case. I already put up a couple of properties and we're getting a good return on these ones here. Yet people, we got, we got a huge demand on these ones. Here. But I can't put up new homes on these ones here if I don't know what my other uh, purchase is, whether or not there's going to be another high rise building that's going to be coming right next to it. So you know, that's that's one of the deterrents here for builders like us and developers like us to kind of leave these neighborhoods. Yeah. And then it just doesn't change. Yeah. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you, Mr. Grewal. OK, so that concludes the questions to the members of the public. And we are at almost 530 and I'm pretty sure there are questions to admins administration. So we will resume back at seven o'clock.
Speaking from Great. Chambers, we are live. Thank you. I'd like to call this meeting back to order. Uh, we will do a quick roll call before we start. Councillor Wright. I see her there. Councillor Knack. Good evening. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good evening. Hi, nice jersey. And Councillor Paquette. Good evening. Hello, good evening. Uh, Councillor Tang. Good evening. Good evening. The mayor will be joining us shortly. Councillor Hamilton. Good evening. Good evening. Councillor Salvador. Good evening. Good evening. Councillor uh, Rice. Good evening. Good evening. Councillor Cartmel. Good evening. Good evening. And Councillor Jans. Good morning. <laughs> Good evening, Councillor Jans. And I'm also here as well, Karen. Oh, I'm sorry. And Councillor Rutherford. Sorry. How could I forget my neighbor? Sorry, Councillor Rutherford. Thank and you. Councillor Principe, thanks for recognizing me. I am here. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, okay, great. So we will continue with the, um, I do believe that we were done uh, with questions to the speakers. Did anyone else have any questions for speakers? If so, please sign up now. I don't see any further questions to speakers. So uh, now, Madam Clerk, would we be moving questions to administration? That is correct. Okay, great. Can you please uh, sign up for count um, questions to administration? Great, uh, Councillor Cartmel. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm happy to defer to Councillor Stevenson. It's uh, her ward. You would like to go first. Oh, go ahead. Thanks, oh. Thanks Councillor Cartmel. Okay. Well, uh, really, my questions are around the comments that were made about drainage. So, I, I guess first of all, uh, is this area of the city on a combined uh, sewer system, or are they separated? Is there someone from administration that can answer that? Uh, Councillor, this is on a combined sewer system. It's on a combined sewer system. Correct. Uh, and there was some commentary about. Um, that, uh, and I guess I wanna confirm this, that EPCOR is of the view that um, uh, the number of units that uh, this zoning would result in on this property uh, cannot be supported by the current infrastructure. Is that fair to say? Uh, no, uh, I, I would like to offer more. So this is an older area, which is on combined sewer system. Uh, that being said, there have been incremental improvements by EPCOR, wherein on 110 Avenue, uh, they did put in a separate storm line to bring it up to the current standards, which is no uh, inundation with water in a one in a five year event. Subsequent to that, with this application, uh, the pre-development flows, if I were to add storm and sanitary, they run at about 7.89 liters per second. Uh, with this development, uh, what we are making them do is store the stormwater on site and release it uh, into that combined sewer. So the post-development flows are going to be about 1.9 liters per second, so which is a decrease from the pre-development. Excellent. So that makes that makes perfect sense to me. I've had that experience in projects I've been involved in. So um, I guess the only question is, and and Mr. Johnson may quiver at this, so please correct me if I'm off, but does that not add to the cost of the development? And has that been, uh, I guess, contemplated, maybe that's a question for the for the applicant, but has that been contemplated in this application that any rezoning uh, that increases the density on the property will mean a, a greater than ordinary investment in, uh, in that detention? Does anybody know that? Maybe that's a question to the developer. Councillor Cartmill, it's uh, Ms. Petron here. The applicant is aware of the, the technical requirements that would be needed for redeveloping of the property. 
All right. Okay. Thanks, Ms. Petron. So maybe one more then uh, to Mr. Tawana. Do you know if, um, given this is a, on a combined sewer uh, neighborhood, uh, it's my understanding over time that EPCOR plans to uh, upgrade the system generally and separate the two systems. Um, do you, that would happen independently of whether this zoning application was to move forward or not. Am I correct in that? And do you have a sense of timing? It would be my other question. Uh, you, you are correct in that. So they've been doing incremental upgrades. Uh, like I said, they uh, disengaged uh, uh, two catch basins and they uh, tied them to the storm sewer. Uh, this area is slated for future dry pond uh, further down the, the whole system, uh, a dry pond in the vicinity. Uh, I don't have a timeline for that. Will they, will they actually go underground and... and uh, essentially construct two separate systems or are they going to, will it remain combined for some time? Do you know? No, this will remain combined, but further down the line, wherein we have the bigger trunks, uh, they, they'll create a surge pond wherein during the storm event, the water will be stored over there and then uh, it'll be gone uh, after there is capacity within the system. And that's a surge pond for a combined sewer, a combined sewer trunk? No, that'll be for the storm only. Uh, we, uh, we, do, we like to store only Storm yeah. Water okay. On, on surface. <laughs> okay. I, I, that was my question. Um, okay. Well, those are those are details not germane to the application. Thank you very much. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Stevenson. I'm so sorry. I'll just defer to Councillor Wright. I, I there's going to be some trouble with my sound. I'll just do something to correct that. Apologies, but uh, Councillor Wright, if you want to go ahead, and I'll circle back. Okay, thank you. Um, and this sort of follows along the lines of Councillor Cartmel's questioning with the sewer and water. Is um, I believe it was Mr. Gruel that had given an estimate of about six hundred thousand um, to upgrade the system. Is that accurate, Councillor Wright? We did not do any analysis for the upgrade because it is not required. There are other methodologies with which we will be able to manage. And again, the cost varies from development to development. Uh, we did not do those analysis. Okay, but, and, and Ms. Petron did say that the developer is aware of this, correct? That's that correct. correct. Okay, so hopefully they've done their cost estimates. Um, that's actually, all, that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Stevenson, are you ready? I see that she is trying. Yes, sorry about that. I think um, I think that will probably uh, make my sound a bit better. Apologies for that that delay, though. Um, so thank you. I mean, thank you to councillors Carmel and councillors Wright for asking uh, so thoroughly around that infrastructure question, and definitely something that I'll follow up with with the applicants as well. Um, there are just a few other pieces I wanted to pick up on uh, in terms of um, concerns that the community had raised. So maybe just to start by, just to confirm my understanding. So again, um, well, as a starting point, so I recognize again, you know, just that tension between the existing area redevelopment plan that's that's in effect and, um, and direction from city plan. Uh, so could administration maybe speak to, you know, the processes underway um, to, to address um, this, this issue that we have right now in terms of some of our former plans not aligning with with city plan anymore. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Um, so currently, as you know, um, the district plans uh, for the city are being drafted. And as part of that process, um, the existing area redevelopment plans, not just not just in this area, but uh, citywide are being reevaluated. Um, and potentially for a repeal um, and that's all part of that district planning uh, process which is set to return to council in 2023. Great and and again just thinking through that district planning process so again sort of not not relitigating city plan but just looking to to apply it more specifically and and my reading my memory is that primary corridors 
sort of have that, that development expectation a block or two away from them. Um, but given that this is within that first block of 111th Avenue, would we anticipate getting any, any sort of different uh, direction through the district planning process? No, this is uh, firmly within the primary corridor of 111th Avenue. Okay, thank you. You know, I, I also heard the concern around um, speculation uh, and, and the, the risk of this potentially <clears throat> sterilizing that property or, you know, if it's if the, the home gets demolished and it was sort of sat on for the next few years. Um, I know that we do have another motion underway that's looking at different ways to incentivize uh, redevelopment of properties so that they don't uh, stay vacant for some periods of time. Um, I don't know if someone could give an update on that or just some of those taxation tools that, that we're considering in that regard. So, Councillor, uh, there is an update coming on uh, in June around the sunset clauses in direct control zones. Uh, this being a standard zone, uh, there's, in, there's an inability to condition the zoning on any sort of requirements in terms of uh, redevelopment or, or any other such condition, quite frankly. Um, I was sorry. I was thinking more specifically around uh, the potential to introduce tax subclassing uh, that would tax vacant properties at a higher rate. Councillor Stevenson, I think that was a motion out of the problem properties discussion, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, it's Miss Petron here, and I I can't remember when it's coming back to committee. I think um, probably in the later part of this year, Q1 next year. I can see if I can follow up with that information. Yeah, and that's okay uh, not to have the, the specific de details, but just that there is work underway that, that could help um, mitigate the community's concern in that, that regard by looking at some of the other tools that we have um, at our disposal. That's correct, yes. Okay. And then, you know, I just wanted to, to circle back. I also heard a concern that there's a bit of inequity and that uh, this neighborhood is maybe being treated differently than others. Um, you know, it's, it's my recollection in the past six months that we, we have seen some RA7 rezonings um, you know, in, in next to single detached housing, just wanted to confirm that, um, you know, this sort of single lot RA7 is something that we're seeing in, in neighborhoods across the city. Yes, Councillor Stevenson, uh, we see it across the city um, more commonly in areas like Garneau. Um, we've, we've seen a couple in Westmount. Does that help? We yeah, that's that's very helpful. Yeah, thanks. I think I think that's just good context because you know we do we do want to be uh, treating neighborhoods fairly and, and equitably. So that's that's helpful context for me. Uh, I think those were all my questions, and I'm I'm almost out of time, anyways. But thank you very much uh, for those responses. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. And now, does anybody have? Any questions uh, that are arising from the comments from administration? Any questions to the speakers? Yes, I do. Um, sorry, Warren. Uh, I'm, are we on new business yet? Uh, no, these were. Uh, oh, sorry. Speakers. Sorry. That's all right then. That's fine. Sorry. Um, Madam Clerk, sorry, Councillor Salvador, do you have a question? I have a question for uh, for the applicant. Madam Chair, just to confirm that it is clarifying questions, so questions from Council to the public speakers, to the public speakers for clarification. Great. So go ahead, Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a a quick one, uh, kind of following up where, where Councillor Carmel left off uh, around the utilities piece. Um, I guess, how how has that factored into, um, I guess, decisions around the, the end built former unit count um, and intensity of development that we'd see on the site? Um, also, Salvador, if I may uh, respond to your question. Um, so I think that's a very important question and thank you to Council Capital for uh, bringing that up. Um, so in, in sites where there are basically no constraints and you can maximize your high to FAR, you, you, you tend to um, split the cost by door, 
what I mean by by units. So the more units you 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 provide, the more the, the less they're going to pay, and that's kind of a offset the cost for for the developer. In, in this case, what we learned with a single lot with so many regulations to bring it down into the existing context, what was more important for uh, in, in terms of cost wise was to maximize the area, and that's why we also like. The, the the option three and four that I, I put in my presentation because on that option we can uh, increase the FAR very close to the maximum in the zoning and actually uh, if we're lucky to in the in the design stage to refine that design we get a bonus for having uh, three bedroom units uh, in terms of FAR so and that's it's a, it's a much better approach I, maybe it's uh, somehow innovative because I don't know if it has been tested but. We, we do have uh, consultants, uh, engineers, and, and other people working in in terms of the real estate market. They say, if we have a product that you have a, a better uh, thing to differentiate yourself from, from the rest of what is in the market in, in that area, and uh, it's, it's cost competitive, um, the number of units really doesn't matter as long as it's you, you pay, you're offsetting that cost. Great. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the clarity on that. And I appreciate you um, going into a little bit of detail around uh, the three bedroom unit piece, because that's something that I've been kind of thinking about as well. So yeah, thank you very much. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Salvador. Council Wright, you're next. Thank you. I just have for the applicant, uh, just a few quick questions. Um, you are aware of the cost estimates of the sewer and water upgrade? Yes. Uh, we, we are aware of uh, those costs, yeah. Okay, and then um, um, some of the other speakers had talked about um, your lack of experience. Um, could you maybe give me a better comfort level? Hmm. No problem at all. So uh, we are uh, planning consultants and our client, uh, uh, they have, uh, you know, uh, a extended team of uh, uh, consultants, advisors, and investors. Uh, so yes, they haven't done a, a project before, but that does not mean that uh, you cannot uh, put forward a good team uh, of professionals to uh, come up with a, a great project. In fact, when Green Space Alliance, uh, when we uh, took this project, we were like really excited uh, to really successfully demonstrate uh, to uh, administration and community and council that how uh, the revised RA7 uh, regulations and uh, uh, development setbacks to create a context sensitive development can be successfully uh, applied uh, to this particular site. So we will continue uh, to work with our client and, um, uh, and the community, even at the development permit stage, uh, uh, especially uh, the immediate neighbors uh, to make sure that uh, all uh, their concerns are like effectively addressed, but also at the same time, this development becomes a uh, market feasible development. So, uh, and as you are all aware, rezoning is uh, basically a step in the overall development process. We are trying to create a framework. We truly believe that with uh, a team effort, we can uh, really deliver a good uh, uh, development for this site. Okay, because when I do take a look at your, your website, I. It, um, you are sort of more in the in the de development planning. There, there's no actual construction or. Yeah, and and that, that and that's our point. You know, like right now we are at the uh, rezoning stage, and we are planning uh, like consultants. We are working with uh, uh, the applicant right now, who is the landowner. Uh, so we are not going to develop this property ourselves, but uh, the landowner who is our client, we are assisting them at this stage. And that's how, you know, like really the city planning process uh, works or should work. But as the project goes into the next phases, we will work with uh, uh, the appropriate uh, developers, engineers, uh, and so forth to uh, come up with a development permit application that really works uh, for this site. And does the landowner have this construction experience? So, Councillor Wright, uh, I think we're getting some uh, signals from our legal that uh, these are not the appropriate questions to be uh, asked on the uh, related to zoning, because it's, it's all about land use planning, not who can build and the experience of uh, the applicant. Okay, I will take the direction of uh, legal counsel then and end my questioning. Thank you. Yeah. I'll just add one thing that we have all the right intentions to uh, develop a good uh, development at this location. 
Thank you, Councillor Wright. Uh, so that concludes the questions on new information from council members. Uh, and the next step is for someone to move uh, to close the public hearing on this bylaw. I'll, um, I'll move uh, closure of the public hearing. I requested to speak under uh, new business, please. So, uh, uh, Warren, I know you haven't been uh, in front of council for uh, recently, right? But uh, we uh, council made some changes uh, where on new information, uh, members of public only respond if council members ask them questions and council, uh, not directly respond to uh, uh, new information. These changes were made a few months ago by council. Yeah. So sorry about that. Yeah, that's that's actually very interesting. Yeah. I mean, I sat here and I heard something that was simply not correct. Somebody can I ask you a question. Maybe I'll ask you a question. Okay. Uh, uh, just because you are new to the process and uh, you haven't, uh, need, you didn't know, know about the changes, so I just want to give you an opportunity. Uh, okay, I'll ask that question. What is something that you want to say? So, can I proceed with my comments? Yeah, I just don't know, like, what are, I, I, I missed part of that, right? I just do, uh, what, what, what do you have to say? Okay. Well, first of all, while listening, I heard uh, some comments about how poverty and poor people and rentals are somehow tied together. And they aren't under most circumstances. But when a community gets above 25 to probably 30% uh, poverty rate, and Central McDougal is about 50%, which is just about as high as you can get almost anywhere, then if you do the research or you look at really smart social scientists or you look at some of the early work of Gallister or whatever, you find that things start to dramatically change. Poverty and crime and those things start to go together. And then the infrastructure that you build starts to get used in dramatically different ways. So under a normal community, you know, you develop a, a rental house and, and, or a rental property, it doesn't make much difference. When in Central McDougal, with the poverty rate that we have at 50%, tied for the highest crime rate in the city, we now have become almost a hub for people who even hide behind the vulnerable people and do commit crimes. Okay. And that I... becomes a real problem. So when you're building infrastructure, you have to look at the community as a whole. And I have always thought that infill was supposed to be about creating mixed income uh, and mixed housing opportunities. Good. We're actually the exact opposite of an inclusive community. We're an exclusive community. Now we are exclusively poor. Nobody wants to come here because of the safety issues. And at the end of the day, that's almost the reverse of where we should be. Okay, I, I'm going to stop I, you there now. I think that's that. Okay, you made your point, so uh, I think your point is uh, uh, noted. Uh, so well, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm, no, I'm, I, I would have really kind of liked to have finished because you know, if you have 90% of the people rent and they rent in poverty, and I used to have a woman come by my house with three kids and a, you know, a nice Vietnamese woman living in, in a one bedroom, 650 square feet. And she wanted to buy my house and I wasn't ready to sell. And she eventually did what everybody does. She saved enough money along with her husband and moved out. That's what we experience here. And if you guys think you're going to get three bedrooms, it's going to be much more difficult because we actually have a builder living in the community that knows all of these problems. And that's a real problem. And at the end of the day, this technical service you know, we've, we've talked to EPCOR, we've talked to the city, and we know we have a really good idea what's gonna be happening there, and that's gonna be probably 600,000 bucks, and you paid 310,000, somebody's gonna fork up $600,000, it's not going to happen, and we are going to be sick. 
city with a property so, that's sterilized. Mr. Champion, I'm going to stop. Turn developers I'm, off from even coming into the community. I'm so going to stop. The day, I'm going to stop you here because I'm out of my time. I'm yeah, going to stop okay. you here. Thank you so much for your yeah. intervention. Uh, Councillor Stevenson, you move the closing of the bylaw. I need a seconder. Second. Councillor Salvador seconded it. Uh, please vote on closing the public hearing. In favor. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll uh, move first reading of item, uh, sorry, 2.23, uh, 2 oh, sorry, 3.23 and 3.24. Second. Second by Councillor uh, Salvador. Uh, to speak, anyone? I'll, I'll speak very briefly, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, thank you again so much to the community members for coming out tonight. I know it's been a long, a long day. Uh, appreciate the feedback and appreciate the, the commitment that you have to your community. I think uh, it's always really encouraging to see. And, and I think that the, the love of you, that you have for your neighborhood, the, the great opportunities that it offers is something that, you know, I'm hopeful that, that more people can enjoy as well, um, which is why I'll be supporting this rezoning. Um, it's, it's very consistent with our, our city plan and where we want to go as a city. Um, I do, I do just also think it's important that we, we reflect on how we speak about our communities and our neighbors and, and appreciating the, the challenges that, that are faced in your community. I don't mean to diminish those in any way, but I think it's, it's always important for us to look um, at, at some of the other causes and, and look to address those causes um, head on um, and not, not necessarily conflate them with, with different ways that people choose to live. So I will, um, I, I encourage my, my council colleagues to support this. Um, I look forward to the further work that's going to be done through district planning to, again, provide more certainty and clarity to neighborhoods. Uh, I, I really do hear the challenge in terms of not, not knowing what's coming. Uh, and so looking very much looking forward to further clarity beyond city plan uh, in, in that district planning process. So thank you all very much again, and I uh, encourage my colleagues to support this rezoning. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, please vote for the uh, first reading. We're waiting on a couple. Thank you. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor Stevenson. I'm so sorry. I, I move second reading of uh, bylaw 20021 and 20022. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Salvador seconded it. Please vote for the second reading. We're waiting on one vote. Thank you. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mr. Merrill, move consideration of third reading. Thank you. Councilor Second. Salvador seconded. Please vote for the consideration of third reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll move third and final reading of bylaw, charter bylaws 20021 and 20022. Second. Second. Oh, sorry, bylaw 20021 and charter bylaw 20022. Yeah. Thank you. Second by Councillor Salvador. Please vote for the final readings. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. All right, now we are going into <coughs> our last item, bylaw, charter bylaw 20074. 
Excuse me, sorry to interrupt, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Is it okay if I make a subsequent motion now? Uh, Madam Clerk, yes, you can. Well, this is related to the uh, previous item, right, Councillor Principe? Yeah, that's correct. Can you remind me which item was that? Yes, that was item 3.20 and 3.21. Okay, got it. All right, we'll pause here before we go to the next item. So what is... Uh, Thank you. Can you make your subsequent, please? Can you read it? Certainly. Yes, I can. Thank you. There we go. That administration provide a memo to council regarding, regarding the approach to assessing and managing traffic control congestion as neighborhoods develop or redevelop. Second. That's second by Councillor Paquette. All right, we have a subsequent on the floor. Any questions? Councillor Principe, you want to uh, make an, sorry, speak to this? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I had just um, put myself up to ask to speak or to bring forward this motion, but I do hope my uh, colleagues consider supporting this as it is something that will be beneficial to all neighborhoods. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. We have a subsequent please vote. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And thank you for reminding me that, Council Principal. Done. All right, thank now you. we are on to 3.25. Let me find the list of speakers. All right, I'll, I'll go through the names to make sure that uh, people are here. In uh, favor, David uh, uh, Onishenko. David, are you, Dave, are you there? Yeah, uh, present. Yeah, Dennis uh, Rigo. Dennis, are you there? I am. I'm here to answer questions. I'm going to answer questions only. And uh, Renan Soans, to answer questions only. Are you there? Hi, yes, here to answer questions. And people who, uh, community members who are opposed, uh, uh, Jan Nepirala. Nep I'm here. Thank you. And I'm here. Okay, and Pat Matthews? I'm here. Thank you, Doris Shannon. I'm here. Uh, Mona, uh, Mona Ng. Mona Ng. Oh. I'm here. Thank you. And uh, Don Butts. Don Butts. No. And uh, Thi Thu Thong Pham on yeah. behalf of uh, Thien. Thien. Are you Thien. there? Okay. And uh, Kerry Anton. Kerry Anton, are you there? She's raising her hand. Okay, so you're there. Good. And uh, Marilyn Dumke. Present. And Wanda Benas. Present. All right, so everyone is here with the exception of Don Butts. Mr. Chair, uh, I believe we have one additional speaker on the in favor side, Gurmeet Sandhu is also for this item. Uh, Gurmeet Sandhu for uh, in favor? <laughs> right? That's right, yes. Okay. Gurmeet, are you there? Yes, I was on the last one, the McDougal one. I think we're on the next one now. Are you on this item as well? No, no, I'm not. Okay, um, apologies. Oh, apologies. No worries. A, okay, got it. So you were on the last item. Thank Good. You, Good. 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 Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right, so we'll go to administration for our presentation. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. This application is to rezone from IM, medium industrial zone, to a DC2 site specific development control prov provision in the Prince Rupert neighborhood. A previous application for the IB, Industrial Business Zone at the site, was rejected by City Council at a public hearing on March 16th, 2021, after opposition from nearby residents who are mainly concerned with the potential for a crematorium. The proposed DC2 effectively replicates the IB zone, 
but uses the customization offered by a direct control to specifically prohibit crematoriums and address the community's concerns. Next slide, please. The site is located at 119th Street and 114th Avenue within an area of Prince Rupert that is transitioning from heavier industrial uses towards more commercial or business industrial uses. Frequent transit is accessible via Kingsway and it has easy access to a major north-south shared use path connection along the former CN rail line to the west. Next slide, please. From a compatibility perspective, it is very common for transitioning industrial areas to undergo inter incremental zoning changes from the IM to the IB zones. On screen are two examples in close proximity to this site. These are approved in 2014 and 2015. These transitioning areas often have a growing residential component either within them or nearby, and the IB zone is considered a more sensitive and compatible zone than the IM zone. Next slide, please. Public engagement for this proposal included a pre-application notice by the applicant and an advance notice from the city. These were sent to surrounding property owners to a 120 meter radius, the Community League and the Business Association. Administration also posted information on the City of Edmonton website and a rezoning information side was placed on the property. We received 15 responses, one of which was in support and 14 with concerns. The most common concern we heard was that community members did not trust the landowner's intentions and that a crematorium might still be possible under the proposed DC2. There were also concerns associated with the possible impacts of other funeral and interment services outside of cremation, such as unpleasant or dangerous odors or emissions. Next slide, please. The proposed DC2 is based on the IB zone, but has been written to specifically prohibit crematoriums. The zone does still include the funeral, cremation, and interment services use, and the potential impacts of this use are at the forefront of the minds of nearby residents. This is one of 37 allowable uses in the proposed zone. And while it would allow for a service such as a funeral home, the DC2 stipulates that the use cannot include a crematorium or engage in cremation. Within this DC2, any potential development permit sought for a crematorium would be refused by city administration. Next slide, please. In the city plan, the site is near the Blatchford Nate Kingsway Major Node and the Kingsway 124th Street and 111th Avenue primary corridors. Administration sees a transition away from tra historical industrial uses to more business and commercially focused uses as appropriate for this location. Next slide, please. In conclusion, administration supports this application it is compatible with the surrounding land use. It facilitates the continued transition to a more business industrial area. And it uses the customization offered by a DC2 provision to address previous concerns raised by the community. And it does this by removing the ability to develop a crematorium in this location. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Just waiting for the screen to be cleared, so I get a list of council members. Councillor Stevenson, you exempted this, right? But I'll go to, uh, uh, obviously, to the members of the public. I'll go to Dave Onishenko. Uh, you have a presentation, right? That is correct. Go ahead. Great, thank you, council. Thank you for taking the opportunity for us to speak here. I want to speak to uh, our site here, uh, located in the Prince Rupert Industrial Area. Um, this site, uh, next slide, uh, for, oh, there we go, for context, um, sorry, next slide, there we go, it is on the eastern edge of the Prince Rupert Industrial Area, surrounded by other industrial uses uh, and uh, commercial amongst all uh, sides of this neighborhood. Uh, down, another slide, please. 
This is following up on, as was mentioned, a previous application from IM to IB that was supported by administration. Uh, the applicant at the time had stated their intent to use the existing building for crematorium, and which is a discretionary use under IB. And um, at the council hearing, which went on for approximately seven hours, um, there was opposition uh, with the primary concern being crematorium in use. We've documented um, all seven hours of that and, and outlined it. Next slide, please. Um, various local residents at this public hearing stated support for businesses in the area and for IB zoning, but not the potential for crematorium use. No other issues with IB zoning were brought forward at that public hearing. The result was this was rejected due to the intended and stated use of crematorium as a use. Next slide, please. Um, today's application proposes a DC2 that responds to those concerns. Next slide. So uh, this is a new application. Uh, the owner's intent uh, after that public hearing last March was to lease the space to low impact business tenants. And every tenant that approached them uh, were looking for uses found in the IB zone. So we have based this new proposed DC2 zone on the IB zone, and we've taken additional measures uh, for contextual sensitivity to the neighbors. We prohibit crematorium cremation exclusively. Uh, we remove other uses too, above and beyond, to improve sensitivity to the neighbors, which we'll go over. And there's uh, use regulations um, to reduce impacts that are found within the DC that mimic IB and other uh, uses too to reduce impact. Next slide. So some of the additional uses we removed were things that are automotive in nature, bars and neighborhood pubs, gas bars, nightclubs, um, recycling depots, along with all the uses from IM that have a, a big nuisance component, like say a pipe lay down yard that you can no longer do, but can do funny enough, currently under the zone. Next slide. So as you can see, uh, this is an area in transition as the uh, administration said, uh, it is on the edge of this industrial area with another of other IB zones uh, where these many of these same uses and more are found, including the CB1 and CB2 to the north and south of some of this residence. Next slide. And here's some pictures of the site. Uh, this is looking from the southeast. Next slide. Uh, this is right up at it, looking down towards the southwest. Next slide. Uh, you can see the adjacent IB building directly beside the building. Next slide. So today, what the intent of this is for new leasing opportunities similar to nearby properties. This is uh, an area in transition from medium industrial land uses towards light uh, industrial commercial business land uses. And it's significantly more compatible with adjacent residential use than existing IM, uh, IB, CB1, and CB2 uses. Additionally, um, as the owner of the site operates in the uh, funeral industry and operates a, their business from there and does not intend to use a crematorium, um, you know, they, this is a uh, place that works for them for warehousing of some of their urns and other items and uh, fits with these, uh, the zone that we are proposing along with all this leasing opportunity that we are discussing. Next slide. Public engagement as said, we sent out to 80 affected landowners and we heard and responded to 28 of them. Next slide. So as a summary, uh, we believe this rezoning application aligns with the city plan, which sees this area as an area of transition from industrial to more commercial and business industrial land uses. And it addresses the primary concern uh, and other concerns raised by the community at the previous public hearing. Uh, we think that this application meets the vision of the city and is responsive to questions raised. Next slide. Thank you very much for your time and happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'll check if council members have any questions to you. Seeing none, we'll go to uh, members of the community in, uh, in opposition and I'll start with uh, Jan Nepriala. Yeah. Go ahead. You have five, five minutes. It's, it's, I'm calling, yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, yes. Okay. So I, I, I in opposition of the, the changes. Um, this is a very vague 
application. Um, I think we're warranted by um, the first run at this. Uh, I, I, and when we talk about only crematorium, I believe I remember an Aboriginal lady saying um, that the prospect of dead bodies being there was to her spiritual nature not not very welcome. So it was just it wasn't that's very um, um, misleading that it was only the crematorium that was an issue. It was that general business of funeral services was an issue. It wasn't totally crematorium. Um, I think the owner there is putting a lot of pressure on city council that he buys a property and then um, purchases it with all the money that he did and then puts the onus on you guys to change that for his own needs, where he, he could have looked for other, other buildings, other facilities that offer that zoning already. Um, and when we don't really have his intent, uh, I, I feel with the other neighbors of Prince Rupert that there's an element of mistrust here. Like if he will come out right and say what his intentions are, um, if he wants to just rezone it to sell it or rezone it to market it and exclude any type of funeral activities, any type of funeral services, more um, storage of, of corpses or anything like that, um, I'd be willing to listen to him, but when he he opens the door there for funeral activities, I think um, the people of Prince Rupert um, have a fair petition for, for not allowing this. And city council was unanimously um, opposing this. And it's like we're speeding this up. There's going to be a review of crematoriums and where they are situated in the city and bylaws. And I thought. Um, there was confidence on the last unanimous vote that we would wait for that to be done. And then if there was any kind of funeral activities included with crematoriums, that would be done. So I'm really disappointed this has come to council again. It's like it, we're trying to get this passed before the review of that kind of activity in this area. So I, I very strongly speak against this. This is too close to residential. Um, some of the other uh, opportunities that he's looking for here. There is virtually not much parking over there. So if we're talking um, religious services, um, other things that he mentioned there, uh, um, the, the parking is very limited there. So that will that will be uh, probably a pretty busy hub there. And uh, the streets around there, plus other uh, commercial areas, uh, will be overburdened with that parking. So I strongly oppose this uh, Change by city council, and I and I hope that you uh, repeat from last city council a unanimous rejection of this motion. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Next, I will go to uh, Pat Matthews. Hi, thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I quite agree with this uh, first speaker. Uh, February twenty first of twenty one, I sent a letter to the city planner and. Um, our counselor um, asked, mentioned saying that um, if there's no cremation, I would be fine with them using it for funeral services, such as um, storing urns or even bodies. But <clears throat> that said, I also feel a complete mistrust with uh, Trinity and Clarity. I think they have a very good idea of who their tenant is going to be. And that's why the rezoning um, and I was disappointed because I thought that this uh, bylaw regarding the distancing of crematoriums from residential housing was going to be citywide. So if we're just going to fight it for this particular area, I'm opposed to the development and the rezoning. Thank you so much for your presentation. Next, I will go to Doris uh, Shannon. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor and City Councilor members. I'm Doris Shannon. I'm a resident of 11465 118A Street. I live um, more less than 100 meters away from this proposed redevelopment. 
I'm a Treaty First Nations person from Treaty 8 territory residing in Treaty 6 territory. I'm opposed to the rezoning application of the IB to the DC-10 on the location of 11406 119th Street Northwest, as our city has not completed the bylaw review and proximity requirements of the rezoning review initiative where crematoriums is a specific item in discussion. This could let a crematorium into our neighborhood if there are changes for distance needed between residential and and industrial zoning of the DC2 or the IB. Even though the city planner has stated a direct control to prohibit a crematorium. It's a usage that I'm worried about. This location was brought by Trinity to put in a crematorium and fu funeral intermittent services. They have completed a huge amount of electro electrical changes to the building, which is needed for the running of a crematorium and funeral intermittent services, such as storage of bodies and preparations of body for crematorium, for cremation. This is where my home is located. I can't afford just to sell our home and relocate to another area without a lot of mental, physical, and financial stress to my health and to the health of my family, as well as to my community. Our Aboriginal roots have been passed down for having a respectful ceremony in which we are to be with our dearly departed so they can find a way to our Creator. This is not adhered to. The spirits can travel and be around our medium for a longer time, if not adhered. I'm asking for a respectable solution that will help our residential community live in peace and not be bothered again by the threat of a crematorium and funeral intermittent services that can currently be less than 100 meters away from where I eat and sleep each night. We thank the previous city councillors who made a strong stand on behalf of our residential community members to vote against the last change. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Next, I'll go to Mona Ng. Hello? I can, I'm go ahead. Here. I can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Sohi and City Councillor. I want to say thank you for this opportunity for myself and my neighbours to voice our concern regarding this rezoning application that would permit a funeral interment service to operate in the Prince Rupert neighbourhood. Next slide. <clears throat> so some background to this rezoning application. In March 2021, Commemor Group sought for rezoning approval for the purpose of operating a crematorium at this proposed site. Residents spoke out at the public hearing expressing their opposition. The city councillors heard our concern and voted unanimously against Commemorate Group's rezoning application. Next slide. There we go. Okay, in November 2021, residents received a letter from Clarity, who is a representative for Commemorate Group, informing us of their client's plan to, re to seek rezoning from an IM to DC2. Residents responded to Clarity's letter with various questions, including asking what Kamemar Group's intended use are for the property, but no direct response were provided to our questions. At last year's public hearing, when asked by a city councillor if the rezoning application was not approved, would the applicant be negatively impacted? The applicant stated that they would not be and would use the building to purchase that they purchased to sell urns. If this is their true intent, I believe they can undertake this business activity under the general industrial use category under the current I, I am zone. Next slide. During the public hearing last year, the city council understood the difficult dilemma residents were faced with in regards to the proximity of the crematorium to our homes and to protect the residents they voted to oppose the rezoning application and also requested the zoning bylaw renewal committee to add crematorium in their review. We were very thankful for that. Crematorium is closely related to funeral and intermittent service and the outcome of the new zoning bylaw will have an impact on where funeral interment and crematoriums can be zoned in Edmonton. The public engagement on the draft new zoning bylaw was originally scheduled to take place in January of this year. It has now been postponed to September. Next slide. 
So our home is our sanctuary, a place to relax and wine and gather a gathering place for friends and families. Having a funeral and interment service be conducted 20 steps from our backyard robs us of our sanctuary place and affects our mental health. Next slide. So Kingsley, Kingsley Landing is a two block residential home built in 1997 to 2000. These homes in Prince Rupert neighborhood are the closest homes to the industrial area located on the west side of 119th Street. For 25 years, residents of Prince Rupert lived harmoniously with businesses in the industrial area. Asking residents to accommodate the funeral service business, which would operate right behind their homes, is unfair and unequitable. There is a total of 57 residents living in Kingsway Landing area. Next slide. So very little separation. This is a picture gives a bird's eye view of the rezoning location uh, to the residential homes on 118A Street. As you can see, the only distance separating the rezoning site, the green rectangle, and the residential homes in a, on 118A Street is the 119th Street, which is a two-lane wide road. The distance between the IB's location just south of the rezoning site and the residential homes denoted as the RF1 is 119th Street plus the AP area. Next slide. So from the moment residents received the letter from Clarity until this point, we have been engaged and have consistently expressed our concerns and opposition to the applicant and to the city planner, hoping for more dialogue and transparency. Unfortunately, our efforts were not fruitful and we are here today again. What residents want is that this zone, this location to retain its current I am, I am zone until greater clarity is known from the enactment of the new zoning bylaw. The reason is because the city planner stated that, that the zoning bylaw renewal project is only addressing standard zones and not DC2 provision. So if this, does, if this rezoning application is approved, the new zoning bylaw changes like crematorium setback distance will not have an impact on this location, which places residents in a very precarious position just like last year. The applicant can in the future reapply for the rezoning to remove the prohibition of crematorium. And if this location is zoned as a DC2 provision today, new rules stemming from the new zoning bylaw will not apply to this DC2 provision, which currently allows funeral, cremation, and interment as a use. The IM zone does not allow for crem crem ah, funeral, cremation, and interment as a use. Therefore, approving this rezoning application puts residents in a terrible situation. We won't be able to reap the benefits from the new, sorry, oh, I guess my time is up. Yes, uh, Ms. Can I finish or no? No, I'm sorry, you already, you already went over five Fine. minutes. All right, so, okay, I'll, I'll stop. Sorry about that. And next we'll go okay. to, no, next we'll go to uh, Ms. Thong Pham. Uh, Sorry, uh, who? Is this uh, the... Carrie, Ant Carrie Anton? No, I am uh, actually just told on. I'm going to check if Don Butts is joining us. I saw his name up there. And I'm just going to suggest that, uh, Mr. Butts, if you uh, are having audio issues, if you try leaving the meeting and rejoining, that might work. He might okay. just not be able to technically join. Good. Him. We'll come back to um, we'll come back to him then if he joins back. And next one is Thi Thu Thong Pham. Did I say it the right way? Oh uh, yeah, that's, I am going to talk because uh, my name is Hai Nguyen and Chang Pham uh, husband. Yeah, I'm here to. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Again, yeah, again, the um, DC2 rejoining application because it's done not um, include the funeral, uh, cremation, and the interment service is needed possible here. And um, our family uh, moved here in 2020. We, we feel very happy to live in a very convenient, uh, very enjoyable neighborhoods. And we like to live close to superstore. Um, Canadian Thai coffee shop and everything around, but uh, but uh, it's really uh, horrible when uh, repeat from the 2021 and 2022, the same company reapply uh, to open the new business with the uh, with possible maybe cremation um, in the future, right? And uh, 
and um, and uh, we we as we uh, if this happened we 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 don't want to relocate our home because it's maybe cost us a lot of money and efforts and everything, and um, that's the reason why we we uh, strong again on this uh, rejoining application and uh, we hope. Uh, yeah, we, we, we hope the uh, city will reject this application. That's, that's everything we want to say. Thank you so much for your presentation. Yeah. Uh, I'll check back if Mr. Butts is there. Hello. Yeah. Are you there? Hi there. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for your time. I just wanted to voice my opposition to the proposed rezoning. I enjoy my neighborhood as it is and has been for the past 25 years. I feel that the proposed rezoning will make unwelcome changes. The, the information given regarding the proposed changes has been vague and has provided little to satisfy my concerns. This is the second time in two years that app application for rezoning has went to city council there does not, to, does not appear to be any additional information that has been brought forward that would explain why this rezoning application is necessary. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Butts. And next we'll go to uh, Carrie Anton. Thank you, I'm glad I could be here. If the clerk could please play my video presentation. One moment, please. Mr. Chair, will we do some troubleshooting on the technical side? Yeah, so I'll go to next speaker. speaker. So uh, we'll, I'll come back to you, uh, Ms. Anton, uh, until we figure out the uh, video situation, and I'll go to uh, Marilyn uh, Dumke. I also have a slide presentation, PowerPoint. Have you shared that with the city clerk's office? Yes. Okay. Good. I have, yes. Oh, got it. Here we go. Yep, there we go. Yeah. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak, especially considering the hockey game, I believe, is just starting here. Uh, I won't go a lot into the background here um, because you've heard it from the other residents about uh, back in December 2020 getting the rezoning notice from IM to IB. I did a lot of research at that time, and we had a lot of concerns regarding crematorium emissions. Um, combustion gases, particulate matter and fine dust, organic pollutants and heavy metals, including mercury, are vaporized and radioactive byproducts from cancer treatment. So within that, uh, other jurisdictions across the world and Canada have some minimum separation distances included um, to, between the sensitive areas, sorry, my dog, areas and crematoriums. So we attended the public hearing on March 16, 2021, and there was the unanimous decision and council wanted that it included a minimum separation in the zoning bylaw renewal initiative. They did not want our community to suffer due to a grandfather clause. In April, 2021, uh, Dr. John Laureano, the owner and president of Trinity Funeral Home came to my doorstep. He had the question to me of if the community would support rezoning to DC2 with the wording prohibiting crematorium. I told him at that time that based on the untrue statements he had provided the community before, the lack of integrity and no, there was no credibility with this community. And so it would be very unlikely that they would support that. 
I asked him what the use may be, and he did state that it could be preparation and storage. So here we now are at the next rezoning application. Uh, we were asked by Clarity to provide our feedback, which we did. Uh, the city planner also uh, reached out to us and we provided feedback to him. And one of the concerning things I found is the wording that he used is they were very confident that it would re not result in any legal crematorium or cremation activity. It just wasn't strong enough wording for me. I also contacted the EFCL planning advisor and he mentioned that the wording would be flagged by the law branch and the planner. Advised to ask about it as it seemed like a potential workaround. I also have two questions from the, the report from administration. On page six, there is a map which states that um, the map shows other sites in the area where a crematorium could currently be developed without any decision or action from city council. So the problem with this is the, the area that he has marked within Prince Rupert is a storage water pond and a playground. Also on page seven of the report, I noticed, and perhaps it's a typo, but it says, this is one of the 37 allowable uses in the proposed DC2 provision and could be still, and could still be pursued as long as the use does include a crematorium or engage in the reduction of the human body or companion animals, heat to ashes, etc. I believe it should have said does not. So the concerns of the community is distrust, distrust of the applicant's intent. We're concerned there's a loophole that there could be a crematorium developed. There's been no guarantee. And another application could go forward, which would include a crematorium as it will already be rezoned for the funeral and tournament services. We were hope waiting for the wording from the zoning bylaw renewal initiative regarding the minimum separation. So finally, I just ask council to understand our concerns, diligence, but, and to ask the questions of administration to ensure there are no loopholes here. I also would request that you uphold the previous council's decision. Impact in the future of another rezoning to allow crematoriums on site would be very unfortunate for our, com our community. We want a guarantee. Sorry is our, my worst fear as there is, if there is an unanticipated workaround. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. And is the video ready for uh, uh, Carrie Anton? We are going to try it again. One moment, please. Okay. Hello, my name is Carrie Ann. Hello, my name is Carrie Anton and I'm a resident of Prince Rupert Community. And I want to oppose this Charter Bylaw 20074, which will allow IM to DC2 in Prince Rupert. There was a public hearing in March 2021. and the first reading, unanimously, City Council said more work needs to be done and they declined the application. That agenda item took five plus hours to discuss and to debate. There was questions back and forth. There was over 25 speakers, people from the community and people who were total strangers to the community, but just had things they needed to share. The result was that we, the recommendation to go and rely on the zoning bylaw renewal initiative. But at the time of that public hearing, council was assured that the applicant would be under no financial loss or burden to stay as an IM. Um, they will find tenants, they said, um, not a problem. They have other business that they can do in, in the facility as it's an IM. They bought the building pre having it zoned for their intended use, and they were given assurances at that time by administration, they said. But they also told PRCL that they like to work at night. Um, it's more calming and it's peaceful. Um, it's highly regulated, which we now know it's not. 
Um, we also s- found that they had complainants because those soul strangers attended our public hearing and to give the information and photos to council of emissions. Um, they said, no worries, we'll be good neighbors. Well, no trust when there's no truth. So here we are again. They're trying to get another kick at the can, as it were. But the zoning bylaw renewal initiative is delayed. So, as I said, the outcomes are not available. Funeral services is also very disturbing to our community, not just the cremation piece of it. That can include body preparation, body storage, delivery, transport, embalming, um, internment services besides burial. Um, and we're worried that by allowing this rezoning, it will grandfather this applicant into being able to do cremations and other services that we don't want in the area, basically um, creating a loophole and possibly excluding yes. controls um, after the bylaws have all been renewed. We have broken trust, as I said. There's been some interactions with residents um, on a personal level, which totally violates privacy and safety. I'd also like to point out on page six of the administrator's report in the compatibility section, there should probably be the word not after uh, use does not include a cremation. Um, We rely on city and city council to protect the safety, health, and welfare of its citizens. And that's a mandate that the city has. Um, And we have serious concerns about the separation distance from funeral service cremation and internment service businesses to residents because of public health and because of uh, respect of cultural and religious beliefs and as well inequity of the existing residents. Oftentimes they don't have somewhere to move but someone coming into the community like a business or like a new resident they have a choice. So asking our existing residents to move because this area has been rezoned is really totally inequitable. I want to also point out on page six of the administrator's report talks about superior legislation. And we determined from the last hearing that there is minimal regulations. Um, There is minimal monitoring and minimal enforcement beyond what the city bylaws have for nuisance. So what we know what we have today, if we look over at that building, We see that there are three delivery locations on many sides of the building facing our homes. They like to do hours of operation at all hours of the day, including in the night. There is possible noise from deliveries and backup beepers, etc. There's also a lighting concern from this specific lot because they have installed lights that actually shine into the back of our home. The triggers of mental health and um, with religious and cultural beliefs, there are many options for this particular applicant to do their business at their own funeral home just up the street. So we ask that you oppose this lot rezoning because the zoning bylaw renewal initiative is not complete. There is no defined separation or proximity to residents. We need to know that the city understands diversity and trauma-informed practices when it comes to developing plans for the city. Thank you for your time. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your night. Thank you so much for your presence and and the video. Thank you so much. Uh, All right, our next speaker is Wanda... Vanessa? Uh, Vanessa? Vanessa, thanks. Sorry about that. Yes. Vanessa, go ahead. Like Vanessa. All right. Well, um, good evening, Mayor, and oh, am I ready, Pete? Good evening, Mayor and Councillors, and I and my fellow Prince Rupert residents. Um, I've lived in Prince Rupert for Well, my parents were here in the 60s, and I've been here owning this house for 22 years, so I'm a long-term resident. And what happens in Prince Rupert affects every resident of Prince Rupert, no matter how far away you are. Now, everybody has, they have done great presentations, and I could not expand more on what they've said, because I would only be repeating myself. 
but I will tell you, I oppose the rezoning to BC2 as the bylaw review initiative previously recommended by council to study the impacts of funeral, cremation and internment services on communities must be complete before this type of rezoning application is approved. There has been no clarity on the type of business that would be in this location. And if it is funeral services, that explanation is much too vague. This type of development is so close to community and homes, the impact it should have greater consideration and control of what business is close to them to enact a win-win situation for the city and the people who live in it. Um, we have to look also on the increasing, uh, oh, the impact of movement of traffic, which is increasing due to all the developments, commercial and number of high density residences proposed. There should be a more integrated and strategic approach to land use planning in the city in this community, and especially in this case. So I don't wanna to continue to beat a dead horse. I am opposing this and asking city council just to allow the study to be completed before moving forward. I thank you for your time and I hope you have a good evening. Thank you so much for your presentation. So that concludes the presentation from uh, members of the public on the uh, in opposition and we'll go to council members for questions. Uh, Councillor Knack. I'm happy to defer to the uh, Councillor Stevenson if she prefers. Uh, Councillor Stevenson is signed up now here. Go with Councillor Stevenson. Oh, sure, thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to everyone for staying with us on this long, long day and um, really appreciate the, the really well-prepared presentations. I think, you know, I'll certainly be following up with city staff just to get some, uh, you know, very clear clarity around around any potential loopholes or, or just how confident we can be in the, in the regulations as they're currently presented. Um, but I just wanted to, to follow up on a couple of points. So maybe I'll go back to um, Mr. Napierella. Uh, I think you spoke first. Um, you know, it, it, it was clear to me in the, the report from administration that the opportunity for funeral um, and cremation services ex exists already in some of the commercial and industrial areas around Prince Rupert. Um, just wondering if that was your understanding as well, or? Uh, no. No. Uh, what I was commenting to was the owner's presentation of um, that the only concern was crematoriums. Um, we, we opposed any funeral activities, including crematoriums. So that's, that's where I was coming at. Okay. So, um, yeah, and, that, and that, that's clear. I understand that. Yeah. Um, but again, yeah. just sort of recognizing that that, that is a use that, that is listed in other, other zones uh, adjacent to the neighborhood. Yeah, but th that, they're not that close. So th this, this is the closest property to 118A Street. So like if, the, if somewhere two blocks down the street affecting another neighborhood there, uh, I, I can't speak to that. But this is awfully close to 118A. Like that's way too close. And uh, I just wanted to say that comment about the owner saying he wants to be a good neighbor. So a good neighbor should listen to his other neighbors and drop this application if he's a man of his word. Thank you. Sure. Well, yeah, and I think you know I'll, I'll follow up with administration, but I I do believe that 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 use is allowed in the commercial area as well. You know where the where the superstore is too, which I think is is you know quite quite close to residential as well. But maybe um, just in my my last few minutes, I was going to turn to Miss Miss Ang, and it it came up a few times just around the work that's happening with the zoning bylaw renewal. Um, again, that's something that I'll ask about. But I, I just want to make sure that I had clarity. So, so, so the thought is that in the future there may be separation distances that are introduced for for cremation. Um, 
but my understanding that I'll confirm with city staff is that 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 wouldn't change the direct control zone. That that in order to add crematorium services back in, it, it would still have to go through another rezoning process. Uh, I just want to make sure I wasn't missing any anything that you were you were highlighting there. Ms. Eng, you there? Yeah, I am. I, I keep clicking the unmute and it goes, flips back to the mute, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm good. Um, sorry, okay, so what I what I read in the city planner's uh, comment and email, he said the, uh, the new zoning bylaw uh, would only affect the direct um, sort of, what was the wording? Uh, it wouldn't affect DC2. So that was my, my concern is that if it doesn't, and if in the future the applicant re goes through this whole process and say, look, I'm going to take out the crematorium, I want to have a crematorium there, then it's not going to, uh, the new law wouldn't affect it. Like if there was a minimum setback with the new zoning, and it's let's say uh, 500 meters or something like that, right? But because it's, it's under the DC2, then they might not have to have that 500 meter setback. Right. That's, right. that's my concern, one of right. my concerns. Okay, no, I, I hear that. I mean, I think I think the, the, the but they would still have to go through a rezoning process. And at that time, you know, administration might might look at that separation distance uh, to determine whether or not it would be appropriate to to add it into the, the zone. So it would be that additional step, I guess. Yes, I know, but it could be very it could be perpetual. This could be every year. <laughs> That's what I don't want. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks I, I don't like hearing the word guest. Sorry to interrupt. Sorry? Okay, so I, I, I'm, I know. Terminology, uh, terminology, I guess it would, you know, that we, we, need, we need guarantees here. We yeah, shouldn't be guessing. I appreciate that. And I'll, I'll certainly be asking those questions of city staff just to make sure that we have absolute clarity. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Constable Stevenson. Constable Knack. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. And, and maybe I'll ask a uh, focus on Ms. Dumke because you're coming from the community league perspective. If, um, so I, I, I'll admit I, I'm, I'm feeling a bit confused. Um, and I want to just maybe share this with you and get your, get re, get your reaction because I, I'm very much gathering there's a sense of mistrust uh, with the applicants and, uh, and our, our legal uh, counsel will instruct us that we can't factor in who the applicant is, but I, I don't want to diminish that. I get that there's a clear mistrust. So one of the ways that counsel, or in fact, uh, I'll go further, the best way, the best tool that counsel has to help ensure we know exactly what can be on a site is a direct control zone. And so what we have before us today is a direct control zone, which removes the, the issue that, you know, I voted against the last one, as, as did four of my colleagues who are on this council, because I think the community made a very important point around why we shouldn't have that use. That use is not in a direct control zone. So this direct control zone does not have that. So I, I, I guess I'm just trying to grapple with the... You know, we, we, it sounds like we got it. <laughs> like we, we did it. You, you, you did it, <laughs> and, and yet there's still opposition. So I'm I'm wondering if you can help square this for me because I I'm not following right now. Okay, so I think the the concern is that with the DC two, it's included the use, right? And and the problem with that is that my concern with another application would be they'd say, well, we already have that use included and so could we not just you know add crematorium to it right i i mean the the efcl advisor you know he also mentioned that he was a bit skeptical when the use class is included and just to please refer to them to council's decision in your comments so yeah, I, and I, I heard Councillor Stevenson will we'll make sure we get that clarity from administration yeah. because my understanding of how we've done this and how the DC2 is written is that there is no way to do it. Now, they could always reapply uh, down the road, but they have that right regardless of the zone, whether it's direct control or a standard zone. But in fact, because it's a direct control zone, we have even greater certainty. Uh, and, and I guess you might remember, I, I made this comment at, when I was speaking to it uh, about a year ago, I said, 
I, I was going to oppose it, but I also said a little bit of be careful what you wish for because the current zone has a far higher impact to neighborhoods. If they actually built to what's permitted under the medium industrial zone, that can actually have an external impact on the neighborhood. Whereas an IB zone doesn't have that ability. Again, flagging the crematorium, which I think was a really important flag. So in my mind, this direct control zone not only goes lower than the, the medium density zone, it even goes lower than the current business industrial zone in terms of uses. They've taken out things that would be permitted under the standards. So I, I guess I, I, I want to pose the same question a little bit of is, is there a worry that, you know, I, I worry that if we say no to this, we're actually setting up the community for substantially worse impact than what, based off what's currently permitted. And I mean, if we don't trust this owner, there's nothing stopping them from buying the building literally across the avenue and then running it that's already zoned for it. And that's sort of what my worry is. It feels like this is the way to provide the certainty that the community asked for a year ago. So again, I'll just turn it back to you and get your thoughts. No, I, I, I totally understand the whole piece about the IM. I know it could be potentially far worse. And so my, my thing is too, absolutely, it could be across the street, but that's none of that. I, I think therein lies the whole thing with the, the by law rezoning, right? That that is where the true answer is because it shouldn't be, right? And here we are, we're, be, we're a bit behind the, the eight ball here. I mean, other jurisdictions already have this in place. Absolutely. And I don't, yeah, I don't think that these other areas should because, I mean, that photo I had in my presentation was of their, their crematorium. And I do not ever want that across the street from me. So I think we are passionately agreeing with each other, just to be very clear. Like I, I very much think you're, you're right. I, I think it was such a great flag from the community. I'm just, what I'm not necessarily, I, I heard a lot of folks present today, but it feels like what I've got before me today gives us the strongest guarantee possible under our zoning bylaw that we won't have that use that you wanted. And it's even pulling out some other things that would normally be allowed in a standard zone, which, on paper feels like, again, like the best of the, the best case scenario. And so I'm just, I'm wanting to know if I'm missing anything or if, or if primarily the biggest concern is that there is this deep seated, understandably lack of trust with the developer. And so you just wanna be crystal clear, hopefully in our questions of administration that there's no way that they can sneak it in as an example. That is absolutely it. Yeah, I don't want there to be a loophole that no, like their legal team or whatever found, and we're taking they're taking this path to allow it. Okay, I've, that's I appreciate why that. Can't, why can't we wait for the review in September? Why can't we wait for that review in September before you guys answer them? Uh, no, I appreciate it. Yeah, so so I, I'm I'm running out of time. I think my time started late anyway, but I hear Councillor Stevenson's going to ask about that. But I just I wanted to make sure I took the time. Thank you, Miss Dunkey. That was very helpful. Yeah, appreciate it. I I Thank missed you. the last person who was speaking, but I would request everyone please only intervene if you're asked to intervene. Otherwise, do not inter interrupt other people, please. And I'll go to Councillor Wright next. Hi, thank you very much. My question is directed to, I think it was Miss Anton, you had the video? Um, yeah. Yes, I did, yes. And I think there in there you had um, expressed concerns about um, the the outdoor lighting. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I just in reviewing the actual bylaw itself, I, I just wonder if this gives you any um, assurance here uh, clause number 13 says where outdoor lights are provided the fixtures shall be arranged installed and maintained to deflect shade or focus light away from sites or adjacent land does that yeah. help no with your concerns? well thank you for you know pointing that out but it's already there and it's already installed um so there is actually i believe a grandfather clause uh, I, I believe that uh, it's already there so um Okay, they're doing th yeah if someone could just take a quick look that would be fantastic i'll confirm that maybe with admin that this will actually 
take away from that grandfather clause. Okay. Or, or and, if and that the, grandfather clause is, it's still in effect. Okay. And, and that may not be what it is, but also the, um, you know, the light pollution, the emissions that come right into people's bedrooms is, is a nuisance. And that's really the only place that the community has to say, hey, there's something going on here, right? Um, that's directly, but that's directly the only thing we can do to try to intervene if this bylaw rezoning goes through. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll double check with admin then that how, how strong this clause is. Okay, thanks, Ms. Antoine. That's thank, all I have. Thank you so much, Councillor Wright. So that concludes the questions to uh, members of the public. And now we'll go to questions to city staff. All right, Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so yeah, to city staff, I, I did just want to follow up on the question of just the strength of the, the DC provision. So my, my memory is that a development officer has no ability to vary any provisions of a direct control. Is that accurate? Yes, Councillor, that is correct. Not only that, but it's written into the use of this direct control as well. Well, and so very pertinently there as well, because it's written into a use, it could also not be overturned by SDAB. Is that correct? SDAB is not able to make any changes to uses in, in zones? That's correct. And there's very low ability for an SDAB to interfere in the regulations of a direct control either. They have to oh. first demonstrate that the, count, that the direction of council wasn't followed. And so in this case, that would be an incredibly tough threshold to meet because, okay. because okay. of how clearly it's written in the bylaw. Yeah, great. Okay. And, and just, again, knowing, knowing the depth of your expertise and, and your excellent legal mind, are there any other loopholes that you can anticipate or, or foresee with, with the way this is structured that would allow a crematorium on the site? Councillor, I, I don't foresee any loopholes in this, to be, to be frank with you. I think by coupling it with the, the exclusion being put into the use, even if you could argue around that, that what you're doing isn't the definition of a crematorium, the development regulation then covers that off by specifically describing the acts. I, I, I believe it's a very strong provision. Great. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, maybe uh, just to clarify, you know, that, that question around what may come out of the, the zoning bylaw renewal in terms of a separation distance being introduced. Um, again, just to, to, to clarify, so if, well, maybe I'll just get an update on that. So that is part of the zoning bylaw renewal work that's, that's happening, that uh, there's consideration of the separation distance from crematorium services and residential. Correct, Councillor. So part of that zoning bylaw renewal is looking at the creation part of that use, not the, the funeral or the internment part, um, but looking at what those proper separations would be uh, between the creation service and uh, other sensitive uses. Okay, and then, so if a, if a separation distance was introduced through zoning bylaw renewal, this applicant would have to come forward again to add in a crematorium use and presumably, if if that um, didn't meet the new separation distances uh, that were set out in zoning bylaw renewal, I'm I'm assuming it would be fairly unlikely that that would receive administration support. Uh, so, not jumping ahead of ourselves, but uh, you were correct in those steps that if uh, the separation dis distances were to be implemented through zoning bylaw renewal, uh, if the applicant on this site wanted that use. Uh, they would have to come back and rezone the site to allow that use to occur. Um, and then that would be subject uh, to the separation distances or there would be an exception to it. And then that would be judged by admin and council at that time. Great. Yeah. And sorry, I guess I shouldn't presuppose any outcome, but that, 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 that separation distance that would come through the zoning bylaw renewal work would certainly be used to assess the appropriateness of, of that use being introduced sometime in the future if that were to happen. Correct. Okay. Um, yeah, and just, just to clarify as well that just, you know, again, sort of under, under the IM zone, there is potential for much higher impact uses um, to the community as it currently stands. Yes, Councillor Stephen, that's correct. 
Okay. And and also that funeral uh, and cremation services is a discretionary use sort of in that those CB2 and, and IB zones that, that are uh, around the community? Yes, it's discretionary. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. I think that that, that provides the clarity that I'm looking for. I, I think I've, I've heard a very clear answer just in terms of the, um, the strength of the provisions as they're currently written in terms of not, uh, not permitting that uh, cremation use. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Knack. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, maybe expanding a little bit on those last two questions, I want to just dig in a little bit more. <clears throat> so again, when I'm thinking about um, that certainty that that I think the community seeks right now, um, I heard Mr. Johnson quite clearly about what the direct control does uh, and, and how it seems to me and just want to get confirmation that that provides far greater certainty than say potentially, you know, if that property owner went and bought the site literally across the avenue, which is currently zoned IB, um, they could go and apply for a discretionary use and that would likely be up to the subdivision development appeal board, but that's a that's a much more likely scenario where they'd be approved than the DC, which clearly says there's no way to do it at all. Is that correct? That's correct, Councillor Knack. Um, thank you. The other piece, again, just, just how I understand the current zoning, which is medium industrial, the medium industrial zone, I think states, and just make sure, I, I can't remember it word for word, but something along the lines of medium industrial allows there to be some it's it's generally tries to keep everything contained on the site, but it doesn't absolutely require that there's no outside impact. So, at, for example, fleet services, you could actually repair vehicles and back them up and forth, you know, throughout the entire day under the medium industrial zone right now. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Whereas under the, uh, and this is a, a modified version of the IB, um, it has to be contained within the site, uh, essentially. So, so you couldn't be having uh, vehicles, you know, 24 hours a day, pulling up, backing up all the time. I mean, you might occasionally get delivery vehicles and things like that, but um, you couldn't do something like a fleet services where you're having potential outside impact in the parking lot, as an example, which would then be heard by neighbors and experienced by neighbors. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So the IB zone has um, strong language to say no nuisance is created or apparent outside an enclosed building. Versus yeah, outside the enclosed, so you can, right. you can work hard within the building, but nothing outside the building. Whereas the current zoning that we have today allows for potential spillover. Not that it's encouraged or or wouldn't be accepted for like a twenty-four hour day impact, but it actually allows for more right now. That's right. That language is should not generally extend beyond. That's so, the wording. Thank yep. you. I appreciate it. Okay. That, that's helpful information. Uh, those are all my questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Councillor Wright. Hi. Thank you. So I just wanted to, the, there was concerns that the report had a typo in there that the word not um, um, was, was omitted. But I do see in the actual bylaw, I think it's 3.11, it does specifically and clearly state not crematory crematorium right yes my so apologies for the typo we're report. guided by the bylaw not not necessarily the report okay and and then in regards to the lighting concern um i think 5.13 does address the lighting it does and then further 5.14 then also gives uh discretion to the development officer that they can um they can request other ways to mitigate or, or negate any of those concerns around noise, light, or odors? That's correct, Councillor Wright. Um, and there is no um, grandfathering of, of whatever lighting situation they have on site. Um, they would have Thank to- Thank you, you anticipated my final question. Okay, okay. <laughs> thanks. All right, thank you very much. Thank That's all you. I have. Thank you, Councillor Wright. All right, so that concludes the questions to administration. At this time, I will ask if council members have any questions to the opponents and, or uh, people in favor out of the informa new information arising out of the questions and, uh, and presentation. I see none, and uh, I ask 
council member to move to close the public hearing on this bylaw? Councillor Stevenson. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move uh, closure of the public hearing on item 3.25. Second. Second by Councillor Paquette. Please vote for the uh, public hearing to be closed on this by now. We're just waiting on one vote. Councillor Jans, we have all the votes. That is carried. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. Move first reading of item 3.25. Second. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Uh, we have a sec for, sorry, first reading. Anyone to speak? Councillor Knack. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I just maybe wanted to jump in as one of the, the few, few councillors uh, left from last term to this term. Um, uh, so uh, remember sitting through that public hearing a year ago, a little over a year ago now, uh, and again, really thoughtful feedback from the community about why we probably need to reconsider uh, that notion of crematoriums within the zoning bylaw. Uh, I think there was a, a, a really good flag and I think I'm glad we're having that broader conversation because as, as we heard through that discussion last year, there are many other municipalities that specifically take the crematorium use and they do have different zoning regulations around it. So uh, it was quite enlightening to go through that. Uh, I, I remember going into that public hearing, and it's the beauty of keeping an open mind going into public hearings. I first thought I was a year ago I was going to vote for that zone because I thought an IB zone, that's pretty standard. And then we had great thoughtful submissions from the community that said, no, you really can't. And uh, I changed my mind and, and voted against it um, as part of that group. Um, you know, what I heard today through the answers, and, and again, I appreciate that there's there's maybe some of that, that lack of trust right now, but I am happy to support this because again, the direct control zone gives us the strongest level of certainty possible that what the community is not interested in. Uh, so, so we will not have that crematorium use and there's no better tool to use than the direct control zone. So uh, that's why I, I think it's happy to support it. And, and in fact, again, this zone, this direct control pulls out some additional uses which are permitted uh, on sites even across the avenue uh, that are currently rated uh, uh, zoned IB. And I think in recognition that there was potentially that concern about those additional uses spilling over as an impact to the, to the broader community. So uh, for me, this is, everything that had been asked for and actually more quite frankly uh which is good so so i, I and i hear the hesitation i know a lot of folks come in opposition but i just i think i wanted to speak as someone that was here last year and say um you got everything and more by this direct control zone so that's why i'm i'm happy to support it because i think we are going to cover everything you were raising as concerns uh and, and this is as someone who didn't support the last one because of the very valid points that came forward. So I'll support this, but just maybe wanted to provide a little comfort as, as one of the returning folks here. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Councillor Stevenson to close. Yes, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks again to all of our speakers for coming out uh, for such a long day. Um, again, the clarity of your presentations was, was excellent. And I think, again, as, as Councillor Nack has said, I think the what we see before us right now is a direct result of the excellent advocacy that you've done, not only for your community, but for the neighborhoods across uh, the entire city who through the zoning by renewal process will have uh, greater, greater clarity and um, separation from crematoriums moving forward. Uh, the answers that I got um, today from, from our city legal advisor makes me feel really confident that the, the zone is written in a very um, very solid way that there aren't any loopholes um, that, that would enable a crematorium to kind of come in uh, through the back door. So um, having that clarity, I, I do feel confident supporting this application and again, really thank everyone for their advocacy uh, on this issue. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. So please uh, vote for the first reading.
just waiting on two votes. Councillors Jans and Councillor Jans. Councillor Jans, we're waiting on your vote. Councillor Jans, are you still there? I just saw that he exited the meeting. Oh. Okay, we'll mark him absent. Okay, please. We have all the votes. Let's play the votes. That is carried. Thank you, Ms. Rear. I'll move second reading of item 3.25. Second. Second by Councillor Paquette. Please vote for the second reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move consideration of third reading of item 3.25. Second by Councillor Paquette, right? Yes. Got it. All right, so please vote for the final reading. Sorry, consideration for third reading. Consider consideration for third reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Thank you, Ms. Oh, sorry, thank you, Ms. Rare. I'll move third and final reading of Charter Bylaw 20074. Second. Second by Councillor Paquette. Please vote for the final reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So that concludes our agenda. Any notices or motions or motions without customary notice? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Now we can go watch the hockey game.